baseball. Today, the Mets take on the Montreal Expos. Participating advertisers are Budweiser, the king of beers and proud sponsor of the U.S. Olympic team. For all you do, this Bud's for you. Dotson, Nissan builders of high-quality cars and trucks for 50 years. Available at your Dotson dealer. Manufacturers Hanover Trust, where our facts make your money worth more. Pitching for the Montreal Expos in today's game is Charlie Lee with a record of 2-1, and one, an earned run average of 2.53. And going for the New York Mets, Walt Terrell, who has won two and lost none, with an earned run average of 1.80. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Ralph Kiner, along with Tim McCarver and Steve Sabrisky for the second game of this homestand, the Mets against Montreal, and a young pitcher, Walt Terrell, going for the Mets. He has won all of his games so far this year. He has to stop a losing streak. A losing streak of three games, two to the Cubs and one to the Expos. Going against Walt, Charlie Lee, a tough assignment for the Mets. He was 4-2 and two last year, 7-4 and four lifetime against the Mets. So I don't think you'll see the same thing happen today that you saw yesterday, a 10-0 blowout. Yesterday, the Mets lost to the Montreal Expos before 47,000 people. Speaking of pitchers, let's go down to Steve Sabrisky and his guest. Thank you, Ralph. I'm here with Ron Darling, who was roughed up pretty bad yesterday by the Montreal Expos, and some people would say by the home plate umpire as well. How did you feel yesterday, Ron? It was an appearance that you never really got into your rhythm. Yeah, I was tight all day, Steve, and it, it, was, it was disappointing. You know, you're going to have your bad outings, but I was really disappointed that it happened on opening day in front of all our fans. But um, I'll just try to get them next time. There's been comment about the umpires testing the Mets, their young manager, their young pitchers. You felt, that, Do you feel that yesterday you were being squeezed with some strikes? Well, I, I feel um, that a lot of the strikes I threw were close enough to be called strikes, but um, and the bottom line is the umpire didn't think so. And uh, there's really nothing I can do about it. And um, again, the umpire didn't throw the 2-1 pitch to Carter that, hit, that was hit for a grand slam. <laughs> Ronnie, what do you do after a, uh, a bad outing like this? You were breezing along with two good starts, and you and I were talking earlier about this being a humbling experience. I'm sure in many ways it helps you. I think it does, especially when you're young. Um, I think our young staff, we're going to have games where we're awesome, and there's going to be other games where we're going to be inconsistent and, and, and not have as good a game. But I think this makes you just work hard. It's going to make me work hard in between this next start, and hopefully I'll get them the next time. All right, best of luck to you, Ronnie. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. Ron Darling, who will be back in there, and better things ahead for RJ. Now let's go back to the booth to Ralph and Tim. Well, the Mets have won six and lost four. The Expos have won six and lost five. And defensively for the Mets, it's Keith Hernandez at first base, Wally Backman at second, Jose Oquendo at short. Hubie Brooks playing third base, George Foster in left field, Mookie Wilson in center field, and Daryl Strawberry in right. The catcher is John Gibbons, and the pitcher is Walt Terrell. Terrell comes in with a record of 2-0, an earned run average of 1.08, and he has one victory over Montreal in his career. So Terrell with an overall record of 10 wins and 11 losses in his major league career. Last year he was 8-8, eight and, eight, and he'll be working against this lineup. Well, record pace setter, a litany of records. Pete Rose leading off and playing left field, followed by Brian Little, the second baseman, the fine center fielder of the Expos, Timmy Raines, who moved from right, from left field to center field, for Andre Dawson, who will play right field with those bad knees. He'll bat fourth. Gary Carter with a big grand salami yesterday will bat fifth. Tim Wallach on a 10-game hitting streak, the third baseman batting sixth. Terry Francona, the first baseman batting seventh. Arhanis. Salazar, the shortstop, will bat eighth, and Charlie Lee from Memphis, Tennessee, will be the pitcher. And the manager for Montreal, Bill Verdon, former Major League ball player, another former Major League ball player, Davey Johnson, the manager for the New York Mets. The umpires for the game today, Lanny Harris behind home plate, John Kibler at first base, Bruce Framing at second, and Jim Quick, the umpire at third base. And Pete Rose stepping into the batter's box. Pete has batted with more at-bats than anybody in the history of Major League Baseball. 13,082 at-bats. And Pete Rose has no home runs, four RBIs, and a 3.11 batting average for this year. It's about six careers, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of wood Take it up to that plate. He has played in a total of 3,261 games. The all-time leader, Carl Yastrzemski, with 3,308. And the first pitch by Terrell ball one. Harrell has worked 16 and two-thirds innings, given up two earned runs. And a good sinking fastball, one ball, one strike. 
bulldog tenacity of Walt Terrell against the bulldog tenacity of Pete Rose. Terrell's long suit is his courage. And he misses with a fastball to count two and one. Rose has had a total of 713 two base hits. The all time leader is Tris Baker with 793. And it's granted out to Hernandez and Hernandez to Terrell and Terrell makes the tag of the bag. So one away. And Brian Little will be the next man to bat for the Expo. Well, the sinking fastball, Pete Rose tries to pull it. Pete has made his living hitting line drives up the middle. He tries to pull this sinker, and it's an easy play for Hernandez and Terrell. So an out made it first, and Brian Little stepping in. Little, the best bunter in the National League. He's had four base hits for bunts this year, one of them in yesterday's ball game. Of his first 100 hits, 27 have been bunts. And yesterday, Hubie Brooks burned by Little in a bunt. Now play right on top of him. And the fastball for strike one. Little hitting 388. He leads the league in base hits with 19. And the third baseman no more than about 65 feet away from the batter. Ground ball in the hole. He gets another base hit. So Little with his 20th hit of the year and the first hit of this game. Brian Little went on a weight program over the wintertime. And it's obviously helped him. It's, it appears that he's swinging the bat with much more authority this year. Coming around on the plate. Even though it Stop is early, those balls are ringing around. off his bat. Last year, Rain. it was almost as though they could knock the bat out of his hands. You mentioned the 24 bunt base hits. He batted only 260. That's not bad for a guy who can play shortstop and second base. And the man who's playing center field in this year's Montreal uniform, Tim Rain, stepping in. Rain's hitting 356. He takes for ball one. Speaking of second baseman, huh? Rain started his career as a second baseman. Moved to left field, now moved to center. Andre Dawson moved from center field to right. One ball, no strikes. And a fly ball to center field. Mookie with the glasses down, and he makes the play. Little back to first, and two men away. That will bring up Andre Dawson. Dawson hitting 220 for the year. Last year he batted 299 with 32 home runs, 113 Number 10, RBIs. Montreal right fielder. Andre Against New York last year, Dawson hit only 167. That was the reason the Expos were 8 and 10 against the Mets last year. Dawson hit 167, Reigns 239. And Francona 200, so they held down the big hitters. Not so Tim Wallach and Gary Carter, who both hit over 300. Dawson 0 for 4 yesterday. And the slider for ball one. Andre, runner up in the MVP voting last year, probably lost it the last month of the season. And that's ball two. Dale Murphy had a fine September. Dawson had a poor September, and Murphy was the MVP. Yeah, you mentioned yesterday that Murphy, what do you have, 10 home runs, 10 home and Dawson runs. only four in the month of September. They called him a hawk. And a good swing of the fastball, and foul tipped it, actually missed it. Foul tipped it, two and one. Yeah, Dawson is the godfather to Timmy Rain's second child. They call him the Little Hawk, and his name is Andre. And there is the on-deck batter, Gary Carter. So they do not call the Hawk. No catcher ever has any glistening nicknames like that, the Hawk. Oh, picked him off at first base. Hernandez throwing down to Backman, and now Hernandez making the tag, and that'll do it. So the pickoff point for the pitcher to Hernandez, the Batman, back to Hernandez, and the side retired. One hit, no one left, and the score at the end of one half inning. The Expos nothing. The match coming up. Now here's a word from Budweiser. <laughs> Defensively for Montreal, Terry Francona at first base, Brian Little at second, Arhenas Salazar at short, the third baseman Tim Wallach, in left field, Pete Rose, Tim Raines in center field, Andre Dawson in right, the catcher, Gary Carter, and the pitcher is Charlie Lee. Lee with a record of 2-1, and one, an earned run average of 
Last year he won 16 and lost 11. And his lifetime record against the Mets, seven wins and four losses. Hanley with a fine curveball, a fine pitcher. He has had one no-hit, no-run game in his major league career. Charlie Lee, who has worked 21 and one-third innings so far this year, with a record of two and one. And the lineup for the Mets, Wally Backman leading off and playing second. Jose Okindo, the shortstop, batting second. Keith Hernandez, the first baseman, batting third. George Foster in the cleanup spot. Followed by Daryl Strawberry, Mookie Wilson batting sixth, Hubie Brooks batting seventh, catcher John Gibbons batting eighth, and Walt Terrell batting ninth. And the Mets got out of the first half inning by picking a runner off first. Let's look at it again. Outstanding move by Terrell. As little as just flat-footed and can't get back. And now the rundown play. Backman back to Hernandez, who makes a diving tag at Brian Little. The fewer throws, the better in a rundown play. And Hernandez running the runner towards second got rid of the ball quickly. And Walt Carroll, as you look at him there right now in the center of your picture, gets out of the inning. Yeah, the reason you get rid of the ball quickly is you want to have him run back to first in case there's an error. You want him to stay at first base. Every organization trains guys in run down plays to make it that way, and the Mets made it very effectively there. So Wally back with the lead off. Wally one for four yesterday has been on base 13 of his 27 plate appearances. So he has done the job as the leadoff batter and he's hitting 364. Eight base hits no home runs and no runs batted in and time is called. Time called by home plate umpire Lanny Harris. Back one. Batted 167 in 26 games with the Mets last season. And Charlie Lee's fastball is fouled away. Montreal playing Backman as though he were a right-hand batter. They don't shift as much against him as some other clubs do. Lee, a good curveball pitcher. Comes in again with a fastball. Because of Charlie Lee's breaking ball, you can't take that pitch away from uh, Charlie. And, you, and hitters are more apt to pull the breaking ball. And that's why I think that you don't see the drastic change in outfield alignment that you would have ordinarily with a guy, say, like Dwight Gooden, or primarily a fastball pitcher. Well, the shift is pretty much straight away. And two fastballs on the first pitch that Backman would not pull. And he fouls off another fastball. So with fastballs being thrown, Tim, they are really not lined up defensively the right way. Well, that's why you don't drastically line up. You can't take a pitcher's best pitch away from him. Charlie Lee's curveball is as good as his fastball. That doesn't mean you always have to throw in fastballs. Consequently, play them straight away. There's the curveball, and he hits it in the air to shallow left field. Salazar calling for the ball and then losing it and Backman ends up at second base on the misplay. So Pete Rose and Salazar not getting together and the ball drops in for a double. Uh, Salazar was waving Pete Rose off. Now unusually Backman pops this breaking ball the other way. Now watch Salazar. Salazar waving off Pete Rose. Watch that right arm. See, he's waving him off and now he lets Pete catch it. In my, in my opinion, it's Salazar's problem there because he waved him off. You can't say, uh, I got it, you take it. <laughs> That's what he did say. <laughs> when he saw he couldn't get it, he started to look for some help and there was no way that Rose could help. So the Mets have a base runner and Jose Oquendo steps up. Jose batting 172. He's been at bat 29 times officially. slider for ball one. Incidentally, a writer in Montreal wrote that Pete Rose in the outfield covers as much ground as any other flower. <laughs> Not too complimentary. But in that case, definitely the shortstop's problem and fault. The 1-0 delivery. And a perfect bunt if it stays fair it hits the grass and curves outside on artificial surface no question that would have been a perfect bunt and Tim Wallach's only play would have been to first base but we're playing on natural grass and not on artificial surface so Hosey has a strike instead of a a base hit or a sacrifice 
Watch this ball hit the edge of the grass. Boom, rolls foul. What do they say? If a frog had win wings, he wouldn't bounce. If a frog had, <laughs> if, if a butterfly had wing or had legs instead of wings, they'd call him a butter walker. <laughs> one ball, one strike. Third baseman Wallach in close to guard against the bunt. And this time, Okendo had an idea about bunting, but bunting not toward the second base side. So Charlie Lee with a count of two balls and one strike. Okendo in yesterday's game, batting against Bren Smith, was 0 for 4. Smith getting a complete game and becoming the only th three game winner in the National League. And it's right back to the middle. It'll get the runner over to third. A good play by Salazar to field the ball and back a second and pick up the out. Well, a good curveball and a good piece of hitting by Okendo, an outstanding base running by Backman, and a good play by Salazar. So good plays all the way around. Baseball at its finest. Good curveball, hit well. Salazar makes a nice play, and Backman makes a nice play by going to third, because had Lee caught that ball, he would have been caught in a rundown. And what can't be overlooked, Ralph, is Backman getting to second base on a routine pop-up. A lot of guys wouldn't have been running hard, and Backman got over there to second and now moves to third on this replay. Actually, he moved before the replay. <laughs> now it's Keith Hernandez. He takes a fastball for a strike. Hernandez had a four-game hitting streak stopped yesterday when he went 0 for 3, batting a 250 for the year with 10 base hits. Infield back for Montreal at first, second, and short. And that's ball one. One ball, one strike. Any ground ball to Tim Wallach at third base, there might be a play at the plate. And Backman would have to be alert for that. This is what guys work on in batting practice. Their leads off a of third base and going in on contact on the ground. You can always cheat an extra step on a fly ball and lean forward and cheat that extra step. If the ball's in the air, you have ample opportunity to get back and tag up. Hernandez has driven in three runs so far this year as Charlie Lee works from the set position. And the breaking ball hit off the end of the bat in the count one and two. We were talking about Charlie Lee's breaking ball before the game, Ralph, and it's almost like a fork ball. He has such tight spin on that curve ball. To me, it is the toughest kind of curve ball to hit, and you made an interesting comparison with Charlie. Sal Magley, the great pitcher, threw a curve ball. It was a very tightly wrapped curve ball. Didn't break much, but always broke sharply. There's a drive to right, and the Mets will have a run. This might be extra bases. It's off the wall. Hernandez will have to hurry to get second. Here's the throw, and he's out. Keith Hernandez gunned down by Andre Dawson, who has an outstanding arm. I'll tell you one thing. This is the, one of the best plays I have ever seen off the outfield wall. Hernandez hits this ball so hard, running all the way. Andre Dawson, now watch Here's him play at the camera. Catches it on the short hop Charge. and throws a Watch key there. to second base to get Hernandez. Close play, but I think Keith was out. What a play that was by Dawson. Well, Dawson, a great center fielder, showing why he is an outstanding right fielder being moved there this year. Mets do get the lead, 1-0, as George Foster steps in. And the breaking ball for strike one. Ralph, the reason that was such a good play, the carom wasn't true off the fence. A lot of walls that fall a bang right back to the outfielders. But that was kind of a dead hop when it came back, and Dawson played it perfect. Foster hitting 244. He leads the club and runs batted in with his nine. He's hit two home runs. And the fastball foul back. First three times up yesterday, Foster had that black bat, which is not only different in color, but different in weight. It's three ounces heavier than the bat he's using now. His black bat weighs 35 and a half. The white bat, which is a Keith Hernandez model, weighs 32 and a half. So he should be able to buggy whip that inside fastball better. And Charlie Lee with a two-strike pitch. Fastball 
popped up in foul territory. Coming over, Rancona and bounces on top of the dugout and out of play. So the count remains at strike two on George Foster. Foster last year led the club in home runs with 28. Also runs batted in with 90 while hitting 241. On deck batter Daryl Strawberry. Again the two strike pitch and the fastball popped up. He rolls under it. And Pete makes the catch and the side retired. But the Mets get one run on two hits. No one left on base. The score at the end of one. The Mets won and the Montreal Expos nothing. Now here's a word from Manufacturers Handover. Well, Hernandez singled off the wall in right field to put the Mets on top, one nothing. Was he safe or out at second base on the throw by Dawson? Well, interesting from an umpire standpoint. Now, Bruce Fremming, the second base umpire, had to go out, and the call was made by John Kibler, who was actually at a disadvantage to make this call. What do you think? Safe? Safe. I think safe from that angle. But that dirt covering up the play. That's right. There are a lot of outs called because the Dirt covered up the plate, but I think the big thing in that was it was an outstanding play by Andre Dawson. And an RBI by Keith Hernandez, his fourth of the year, and now Montreal batting in the top of the second. Andre Dawson will start with a new count. He was at bat when Brian Little was picked off at first. So Dawson hitting 220 so far this year with eight runs batted in. Starts off with a whole new slate. And Walt Terrell misses with a fastball. You know, during that six-game winning streak, the Mets were never behind, and they've never been ahead during the three-game losing streak. <laughs> so if you go by omens, <laughs> right. the Mets will put this one on the W side. One and one the count. Great breaking ball in the perfect spot. Boy, I'll tell you. Nobody's going to hit that pitch, even if they're looking for it. That was a textbook slider right there. One ball, two strikes on Andre Dawson with Gary Carter on deck. And a line drive base hit. So Dawson comes back and picks up a single. Second base hit for Montreal. And he reaches out on now this one and gets a base hit. Number Watch eight. his rear end on yes, there. Slider Gary away, Carter. not down like the last one was. And watch his rear end. Boom. Takes a lot of strength to do that because he wasn't using the lower part of his body to hit that ball with. So Dawson at first, no one out, and Gary Carter the better. Carter with a grand slam home run yesterday is seventh in his major league career. Batting 341 for the year with 14 runs batted in. Fastball, a strike. Guys get hits like that, like Dawson just did. You got to tip your hat to him. You made a pretty good pitch on him, and guy just hit the ball. Not on the solid part of the bat. Gene Mock used to say, a catcher's primary responsibility is keep the ball off the big part of the bat, or call pitches that are kept off the big part of the bat. And Carter bloops one to center. Coming up in the ball is Mookie Wilson. Andre Dawson over to third on the blue base hit. And Montreal with the tie run at third and Carter the go ahead run at first. Well, well again, no pictures, just numbers. Batters. Gary Carter got jammed on that Number pitch. 29. Well, he flared one in there, allowing Andre Dawson to go to third. Outstanding base running by Dawson. A lot of guys, even with Dawson's speed, would have stopped at second. And that'll bring up Tim Wallach, who has a 10-game hitting streak. Wallach in yesterday's game was two for four, a chance to pick up another RBI. Ground ball toward third and on through in the left field. Dawson scores the time run, and Carter goes to second base. So Wallach gets a handled base hit. 
the three hits batter. in a row. Well, it's, it's the, the third ground ball, and you're able to slant a couple of Number 16, Terry Francona. Butterfly had legs instead of wings. They'd call him a butter walker. Could have been a double play ball. It wasn't. Now the Expos have a chance for a big inning. Runners at second and first, and the batter will be Terry Francona. That matches Tim Wallach's all-time hitting streak with 11. He had an 11-game hitting streak last year. He is red hot with a bat. His 13th RBI in those 11 games. And Francona batting at 344, stepping in. He takes ball one. Montreal leading the National League and hitting with a team average of 294 coming into to this game. Back in 1930, the entire National League averaged over 300. Hard smash to right, a base hit. Strawberry takes it on one bounce. The runner being held up at third. The throw cut off by Hernandez, and the bases are loaded. Carter held up at third base, and behind him, Wallach at second, and Francona at first. Well, third base coach, that ball down and in, boy. Not too many left-handers miss those pitches. I don't care what kind of velocity or what kind of action you have on whatever pitch it was. Left-handers don't miss that ball down and in. Third base coach Russ Nixon holding up Carter. I think I may have taken a chance there and sent him, even though Strawberry has a strong arm, because you've got your eighth place hitter and the pitcher coming up. And I would imagine the Mets on balls hit to the corners will come home with the ball. Balls hit to the middle, they'll be in double play depth. Arjena Salazar, the batter. Salazar hitting 154. And batting with the bases loaded. The Mets have their infield back at first, second, and short. And the first pitch has popped up. Hernandez is there. And he makes a catch. So a chance to get out of it. One man out of the pitcher coming up. Bases remain. Filled. And now the Expos pitcher. And the batter will be Charlie Lee. Lee has been up eight times this year without a base hit. What does the catcher look for right here? He looks for an unusual movement from Charlie Lee, the batter, in case he is giving the return sign for the squeeze. He went to his cap, then went to his belt. We'll see what the Expos elect to do. Good squeeze situation with one out and the bases loaded and the pitcher hitting. And the first pitch is strike. Third baseman Hubie Brooks is playing even with a bag. Hernandez at first base moves, has moved up a bit, but now is moving back. And it's ball one. One ball and one strike. Mets are well aware that a bunt could be in order here. It would have to be a good one with the bases loaded. All you need at home plate is the tag of the home plate area. The base there. Off the hands, it will be a tough double play. There's one and two, and the Mets get out of it. So in the inning, one run scoring on four consecutive base hits, but three men left on. And the score at the end of one and a half innings, the Expos won and the Mets won. Now here's a word from Budweiser. With one out and the base is loaded, the Mets pull off a fine double play off a ball hit very slowly. I think uh, one thing that aided the Mets' cause was Lee didn't get out of the box. I thought you called it well because I didn't think it was going to be a double play. But what made that, Okendo got the ball to Backman shoulder high, and he got it there quickly. Some of the little things that people think uh, are routine are not routine. Those guys work on that play about 100 times a day and try to perfect it, and it was perfection then. And the youngest regular player in the National League, Jose Okendo, right in the middle of your picture, and right in the middle of your picture on the play-by-play, -play, Tim McCarver. All right, Ralph Kiner, thank you very much. He's sitting next to the youngest catcher in the National League. It's an interesting story that Marty Nobles of Newsday tells about Jose Okendo and how he got that strong throwing arm. His grandmother used to send him out to kill chickens when he was young to put on the table. And instead of catching them and wringing their neck, he'd throw rocks at them and try to hit them. Obviously, that improved their, improved his accuracy, right? Reminds me of the story of a scout seeing a fellow knocking squirrels out of a tree, throwing right-handed. 
And he says, I'm going to sign you up. you got a great arm as a right-handed pitcher. He says, I'm not right-handed. I'm left-handed. He says, why don't you throw the rocks left-handed then? He says, I'd mangle them then. <laughs> Daryl Strawberry batting 263. 1-1 one, one ball game in the second. Good curveball from Charlie Lee. 0-1. All of Strawberry's home runs this year, all three have come in the second inning. All solo shots. He has three home runs, second in the National League, and three RBIs. Ball hit foul down the left field line. It'll be out of play. 0-2 to Strawberry. Rose giving chase. The Expos and a laugher yesterday, opening day, 47,000 strong saw that game. The Mets went down to defeat 10 to nothing. Here's Daryl Strawberry. Darrell featured on the cover of Sports Illustrated this mm -hmm. week. The April 23rd edition. Good fastball from Charlie Lee came back over the plate. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night to Mr. Strawberry. One out. I wonder if being on the cover of Sports Here's Illustrated really is Number a chance. Center fielder. Well, Rookie. not when they make pitches like Wilson. this. <laughs> Obviously, Charlie Lee hasn't read that version of Sports Illustrated. Here's Mookie Wilson. Mookie batting 333, 318 from the left side. He's hitting seven of eight. Oh, bad breaking ball. Mookie swinging and missing. Good breaking ball, but a bad swing. The breaking ball out of the strike zone. I think that's kind of silly. Everybody's saying it's a kiss of death to be on the cover of either sporting, the Sporting News or Sports Illustrated. You take your chances. You better believe it. I think my chances are slim and none, though. <laughs> and slim is going out the door. <laughs> Ground ball, right side, left side. What a play by Salazar. And that's why he's in there for his glove. He's only 5 for 39 with that bat. Oh, what a play. He made Number it look seven. Easy. Against Third a very baseman. fast runner. Yubi Brooks. He picked it and threw it in one motion. Buki and Easy out. And they're two away here in the second inning. Yubi Brooks batting 250. He hit 251 last year. Good fastball from Lee. Charlie Lee's greatest asset, I think, is that extension he has. He really reaches out. He's 6'4", 200 pounds, born in Orleans, France. Good. Looked like a split finger fork ball there. 0-2 oh, to Brooks. Charlie Lee is the only person born in France to pitch a no-hit, no-run game in the major leagues. He's also the only pitcher with a three-letter name that has pitched a no-hit, no-run game. Very appropriate since he's playing in the French-speaking province of Quebec. Jams him with a fastball, so the Expos with a few flares in their part of the second, and the Mets come right back. Hubie's a good two-strike hitter, don't you think? Well, she counted for the fact that he was a good hitter Number with eight. men on base. John Gibbon. Batted 354, led the National League with runners in scoring position last year. John Gibbons had his first Major League base hit yesterday. He's one for 15. couple of knocks will get him straight. Throw to first. Brooks back. This Expo team obviously thinks Hubie Brooks can steal bases. <laughs> they sure have thrown over there a lot. Last year he had only six stolen bases and he's on to first base with two men out. That is almost a balk. Charlie Lee did not move that left foot to first base. You cannot deceive the runner in your attempt to throw to pick a runner off at first base. Charlie came very close to a balk there. Oh, it hit him with the fastball. Tried to come inside, so John Gibbons moseys down the first. Well, he didn't even rub. Oh, he's not going to rub. <laughs> Remember that foul tip the other day in Chicago? Hit him right on the knee, and he didn't Here's even the best pitcher. flinch. Let's Number look at 99. it again. Fastball in on him. Hit him off the elbow. That's a tough spot. It hurts when you get hit there, but he hasn't rubbed yet. 
And it brings up a good hitting pitcher. I going to say, Charlie Lee's in a tough spot now. Walt Terrell with three home runs last year. He's one for seven this year. Can swing the bat. Runners at first and second, two out, one one in the second. Breaking ball is high. Walt Terrell matching Tom Seaver's home runs in a season by a pitcher. Tom had three back in 1972. See where Tom went down to his second defeat, the hands of the Brewers yesterday. Now 0 and 2 with the White Sox. Mm -hmm. Fastball is high, 2 and 0. Oh. And Lee has been unusually wild this year, huh, Ralph? He has been. So far this year, coming into this game, he walked 15 batters in 21 innings. As you look at Bill Verdon, the manager of the Montreal Expos. Appropriately tabbed the stoic by one Steve Zemeski in yesterday's game. Two and out to Terrell, two out. Fastball is outside, 3-0 to Walt Terrell with Wally Backman on deck. Normally a pitcher would be taking in this spot. It might be possible that Terrell will be hitting away. He's that good a hitter as you look at Backman. Very interesting. Should Davey Johnson elect to give him the hit sign? He does it. 3-1 to Terrell. So they threw him a slider there, didn't they? I think that was a heater. You do? Uh, yeah. Burden managed the Yankees and never won a game in Yankee Stadium. <laughs> it's because they played in Shea. Right? That's right. <laughs> Swing and a miss by Terrell, three and two, so the runners will be off here. Mets have to be alert. If you're on base in this situation, you're not running to steal the base. You cannot be ever picked off in this situation. Gibbons at first, Brooks at second. Swing and a miss, he got him, so Charlie Lee running the count to 3-0 and on Terrell. Comes back and strikes him out, his second strikeout of the end of the game. No run, no errors and two left at the end of two here at Shea. It's 1-1. Now a word from Dotson. Fans, a reminder that this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the New York Mets baseball and WOR-TV and is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audiences. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the New York Mets and WOR-TV is prohibited. Tim McCarver and Ralph Kiner, along with Steve Zabriskie, who will join Ralph in the fourth inning, bringing you Mets baseball here on WOR. And the batter, Pete Rose. He tapped to first base. 3-1 play back in the first. Pete with a couple of base hits and an RBI in yesterday's game. He needs 187 hits to tie Ty Cobb. Fastball inside. Unusual that Rose would get his 3,000th single and 1,000th extra base hit in the same season, two days apart. Ground ball, Terrell snares it and throws out Pete. So Pete now 0 for 2. And the batter's going to be hot-hitting Brian Little, who leads the National League in base hits with 20. He's single and was picked off first base back in the first inning. Brian. He almost hit a home run in yesterday's ball game, something that he has done only one time in his career. He did it against Ed Whitson of the San Diego Padres last year. Done it only three times in his pro career, having two home runs in the minor leagues in his four years in the minor leagues. Hubie Brooks can almost carry on a confidential conversation with Brian Little. He's so close. He can shake hands with him. I'm telling you. You got to take that push bun away from him. And a bunt to, to the first base side. Hernandez tags him out. Good play, Keith Hernandez. Little took the uh, 
the front with him, but wanted to get it to the second baseman. But Hernandez very alert on the play. And Hernandez playing even with a bag comes in to field the ball, and now he has to make the tag. And Little has to stay inside that the pathway there that you see. If he goes out of that, he is automatically out. Hernandez has to make a fine diving tag, and Little, I believe, stayed in that runway. He was, <laughs> he was also not even close to first base. He just dove. Well, I guess he figured he could crawl the rest of the way <laughs> if he wasn't tagged out. Here's Timmy Rain. Fastball is inside to Tim. The Rock is 0 for 1, betting 355. On base, 282 times in 83. Good off speed pitch. One and one to Tim Raines. He was the fourth player in baseball history to have 70 RBIs and 70 stolen bases. What a talent. Fastball inside to Raines. Got to keep him off the bases. Tremendous speed. Probably the most prolific base stealer in the major leagues right now. That is an arguable statement. Tap the left side. Can Foster get it? Fair ball just inside the line, and George Foster couldn't make the play. George gave a valiant effort, but Timmy Raines has a double off the end of the bat. Well, there's no defense against a ball hit like this. It's fair by inches. Foster can't catch up with it. It is curving no away from him the all the time. Right and he goes into the stands, Andre and that's a ground Dawson. rule double. So Reigns on with a double, his fifth of the year, and the batter coming up is Andre Dawson. Dawson has scored the only run of the game for the Expos. He's single in the second. And Walt Terrell pitching out of a big jam. The base is loaded. You got Salazar on a pop and Charlie Lee on a double play. One one ball game in the third. Line drive, base hit to right center. It's going to be two to one Expo. Dawson again did not hit it well, but it found an open spot, and the Expos lead two to one. Dawson gets his ninth run batted in. As we look at it again, and he hits a pitch out over the plate. And there's no chance for anyone to pick it up before it drops in. There's Timmy Raines. He led the National League in runs scored last year with 133, right ahead of Dale Murphy. So here's Gary Carter, who's single in the second inning. Gary with the grand slam home run in yesterday's game. Seventh hit for the Expos, and Dawson a base running threat at first. Ground ball, foul ball, 0 and 1 to Carter. Entering this season, Gary Carter had caught 1,253 games. He's only about 700 behind Al Lopez with 1,931, or I think that's about right. Carter has a chance to catch him. He's only 31. He pops this one up. Okendo calls off Hubie Brooks. So the shortstop, Jose Okendo, makes the catch, but the Expos take the lead. One run on two hits, no errors, and one left at the end of two and a half. It's Montreal two, and the New York Mets one. Fans, the Mets 1984 official yearbook is now available. This year's yearbook is 96 pages of full-color photos of all the players and includes a special 12-page section on 10 of the Mets' most memorable characters. The book contains many more features, including historical sections detailing Mets managers, relievers and pinch hitters, as well as sections on Mets and the Rookie of the Year and Gold Glove winners. The yearbook, always a collector's item, can be purchased by mailing a check or money order for 452 Promotion Graphics, Department M, as in Mets, 160 Barrick Street, New York, New York, 10013. Please make all checks payable to the New York Mets. And fans, a reminder, due to the NHL or NBA playoff games, we will not televise Friday night's Mets-Phillies game. Our next telecast will be Sunday at 1.30 p.m. from Philadelphia. As you look at Davey Johnson, incidentally, Tim, the all-time record for games caught, Al Lopez, 1,861. Second to him, Rick Farrell, 
in the American League, the all-time leader, 1,806. Rick Fer Farrell has been elected, or actually has been put into the Hall of Fame, and Al Lopez also in the Hall of Fame. So Gary Carter's only 600 behind Al, huh? That's it, three seasons, four seasons. Yes, this is his 1,260th game. So he is only 600 behind Al Lopez, and being as young as he is and as durable as he is, I would think he's probably got the best chance to catch Lopez. Johnny Bench is, is fourth, I believe. And John retired really ahead of his time. He could have stayed in there a little longer as a catcher. And his last two years, he was a third baseman. Here's Wally Backman, the second baseman, who's one for one, and he's got a run score. Doubled and scored a run in the first, a ball that Pete Rose and Arjena Salazar couldn't get together on. Good strike from Lee. Curveball here. That one went over a high curveball. Incidentally, Al Lopez caught another 57 games in the American League. His all-time total, 1,918. I thought it was 1,900. I thought yeah. it was something. 1918. 1918. The year we entered World War I. <laughs> we were in it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably when Al started catching, too. Two and one to Wally Backman. He must have been an outstanding receiver, Ralph. I played with him and uh, saw him catch. And he had a great pair of hands. Didn't have a strong arm, but one of the fastest releases I ever saw. Fastball is low, three and one to Backman. I used to hate that term. They told me to work on my quick release. I did, and I got one. <laughs> From the ball club. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we. We had an announcer in Pittsburgh <laughs> named Rosie Rosewell, and every time a pigeon would be seen, he'd say, that would mean a run for the Buckos. Ground ball left side. The slick fielding Salazar can't make the play. A little bit, you mentioned Lopez's hand. Salazar's were a little too quick then. He was trying to throw the ball before he caught it, knowing that Backman gets down That's the line. And in his haste, he does have possession. Let's look at it again. He knows Backman can fly. There it goes right off his bare hand, and he just didn't handle it. That'll be an error. Off the heel of the glove, so an error by our Ar Arginius Salazar and the batter, Jose Oquendo. Baby likes to hit and run here. Oh, he got him. And he was going, I'll tell you. And just like on a 3-2 count, you cannot be picked off. On a hit and run. In play. a hit and run situation, right. Good throw by the pitcher. He was dead. Yeah, Lee just kind of, I think it surprised Lee that he was off so far. He just kind of lobbed it to first. <laughs> so we'll see if it's still on. Another throw to first. Another footnote. The catcher, Gary Carter, likes to pitch out a lot, even though he has a strong arm. So they're looking for a hit and run play in this spot. Gary led the National League in assists with 107 last year. He's not running. Curveball is inside. Now he'll go. Might see a pitch out here. Andre Dawson very shallow in right field. Timmy Raines very shallow in center. Look at the outfield. Look how shallow Andre Dawson is. Playing a deep second. Another throw to first. Expo pitchers do a nice job of holding runners close, don't they? They do that. Backman curveball, he swings and misses, and a throw by Carter is in the center field, and Backman can't pick it up in time. A very difficult throw for Gary Carter. Looked like Okendo blocked him out, unfortunately for Carter. And Okendo did a good job swinging at this ball to keep Carter back. Carter has trouble getting the ball into his throwing hand and throws it in the dirt. The ball bounces away. Backman didn't know where it was, or he could have gone over to third. That's an excellent point, Ralph, to keep the catcher back. Even though the, the pitch is not designed to hit on the ground, you see Backman looking there. 
Well, Kendo swung anyway and kept Gary Carter back, and I think that's why he made the bad throw. Good point. Right side in foul territory out of play. One and two to Okendo. Okendo trying to hit the ball to the right side so he can advance the runner and didn't quite get the bat around and fouled it off. Posey did the job with Backman on second and nobody out in the first. He had a ground ball on a nice play by Salazar. He did move Wally Backman to third and Backman scored on Hernandez single to right field. side Wallach and I'll tell you a very tough play had Wallach had Backman led off and then gone out gone after the throw nobody was covering third base huh yeah, nobody was there every look at the play again Backman decides not to go Wallach is in position of looking back towards second and Backman stays at second as Hernandez comes up the unfortunate thing for Backman he couldn't lead off too far, otherwise Wachman, Wallach would have gone to second base to get back going behind him. Here's Hernandez, an RBI single in the first inning. Fastball strike. Probably the longest single Hernandez had ever hit. <laughs> off the fence in right field. <laughs> Outstanding play by Dawson to nail him at second. 2-1 Expos, one out, third inning. Backman on second. Breaking ball hit the left field, but Pete Rose is there and he makes the catch. So there are two out here in the third inning and the batter, George Foster, who has now opted for his black bat. Need a color coordinator for him. <laughs> well, he can afford his own designer. <laughs> George with a tremendous six-year contract for the Mets in 1982, the 1982 season. Foster skied to left his first time up, just missing a fastball inside. See how Carter works in this time. Moving in. Base hit left field. Backman's going to score. Foster's going to go to second, and it's a tie ball game. Well, you got to believe Foster was looking for that pitch. He hits a pitch that's really a good pitcher's pitch inside, and Foster breaks open, gets around on it, takes it right down the line. That's a Foster that played for the Cincinnati Reds. Two out RBI, tying the ball game. Tenth RBI for George Foster. He leads the Mets in that category. And now he's coming to the dugout of the Mets. Looks like his lower back as he's telling Steve Garland about it. Steve's going to pop the upper part of George backs. That in itself is kind of tough to do. With it. Oh, he's Strong got muscles. Man. Muscles all over him. Foster getting around on the inside fastball, hitting it down the line for the double. Let's see what happens as back scores with Foster at second base. Goes in with a stand-up double. He may have done it on the swing, Ralph. He swung awfully hard at that fastball. And all sorts of things can happen to hitters. A rusty stop. Broke a bone in his hand checking a swing. And there are a lot of hitters that have done that. Well, you can pull a rib cage rib muscle. Cage, uh -huh. Even though we have a delay here caused by the Mets, Charlie Lee, the pitcher for Montreal, certainly is in no hurry on the mound. He is a concessionaire's delight. <laughs> All right. George may have got some 
feet on his lower back as he goes back out to second after that RBI double. Looks like George is all right. So a big two out double by Foster ties it. And I am surprised they're pitching the strawberry. I am too. <laughs> First base open. Strawberry, a dangerous hitter. Strawberry must be patient for a strike. A lot of pitchers will pitch around him in this situation. Fastball is low. Pitching around the batter means throwing the ball outside the strike zone and hoping he'll go after a pitch that he can't handle. It's a lot easier doing it for the man on second because then a breaking ball in the dirt will get by Carter. He only goes to third and not scores. I do not believe in pitching around hitters with runners on third base. Fastball is low, 2 and 0. They may go ahead and walk him now. This decision is made by the manager of the ball club. Usually they tell you, don't give him anything good to hit, but don't walk him. <laughs> that's, that's the pitching coach. <laughs> don't give him anything good to hit, but don't walk him. I think him. that doesn't put the catcher in a bind. <laughs> Fastball is low, 3 and 0. This is the most intentional unintentional walk I've ever seen strawberry definitely will be swinging if they elect to pitch to him probably get a breaking ball here I'm really surprised they'll even pitch to him here me too got a fastball strike. right down Broadway what was Darrell looking for crossed up everybody Incidentally, the word on Foster, he has muscle spasm and spasms in his back, and they'll work on it between innings. Fastball is inside. So Darrell had one pitch out of five. The hack, he took it and draws the base on ball. And the batter, Mookie Wilson. Mookie grounded the short his first time. Center fielder. An excellent hitter with men on base. Mookie so far this year has driven in four runs. <laughs> One thing you won't do with Mookie is walking. He had only 18 walks and 630 at bats last year. Jimmy Brooks on deck. Two out, first and second tie ball game. Swing and a miss. Wind blowing in from right field. It'll be tough to jack one to right. Austin playing an awfully shallow outfield in right, as is Reigns in center. Breaking ball, foul ball. So Charlie Lee is ahead of Mookie Wilson, 0 and 2. There's Mike Therese, who has missed a start because of that blister on his thumb. Here you see the outfield, as Ralph was referring. Rain shallow in center, Dawson shallow in right. Fastball is high, one and two to Mookie Wilson. Talk about Charlie Lee's no hitter against the Giants in 81. What about his first two starts last year? Pitched five and two thirds perfect ball in his first start, seven and two thirds no hit ball in his second start. Terry Poole got a broken bat base hit to break up that no hitter in the eighth inning. Ended up with a one hitter against the Astros at the Dome. Charlie Lee should make the play. And he throws out Mookie Wilson. But the Mets come back to tie it. One run on two hits. There were no errors and two left. At the end of three, Che is 2-2. Two -two. Now here's a word from Budweiser. The New Jersey Nets open their NBA playoffs against the Philadelphia 76ers. From tip-off to the final buzzer. 
All the action is on Channel 9 beginning at 8 tonight. Well, they say some people are pigeons. And coming in to join us here for the play-by-play, -play, Steve Sabrisky. I'm not really sure what that means, Ralph, but uh, thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> I think our director, Bill Webb, is fascinated with that picture today. Hi, everybody. As we go to the top of the fourth inning, in a 2-2 ball game, Tim Wallach, Terry Francona, and Arjena Salazar to face Walt Terrell. Waiting for Foster to come out to his position in left field after taking some treatment in the dugout for those muscle spasms on his back. And I think you're right. He probably did it swinging at that fastball. And he did swing hard. Usually you hurt yourself when you swing and miss. <laughs> <laughs> Both mentally and physically. <laughs> That's right. Walter checks the defense. Everybody's ready. Wallach had an RBI single back in the second inning, one for one. And now has an 11 game hitting streak. One. Through the first three innings, Terrell has allowed two runs on seven hits. He has neither struck out nor walked a batter. And a high fastball makes it one and one. was two for four in yesterday's game, so he's three for five in the series so far. Outside, two and one. has a chance to hit in all of 162 games. <laughs> At this moment he does because he's hitting the first a little bit. Bill Dolan back in 1894 hit in his first 42 consecutive games. Oh, that must be the record for starting the season. Absolutely. This will be foul out of play down the right field line and the count remains two and two. Fifty six is the all time. Joe DiMaggio, in 1941, batted 357 through that 56 game heading streak. Pete Rose has a record in the National League, 44. Up and in, and the count full now on Tim Wallach. 1978, Rose hit in 44 consecutive games and batted 302 in the streak. Behind home plate out of play, and it's still three and two. Imagine the pressure, Ralph, that a, a hitter goes through. Even though when DiMaggio had the 56 game streak, there wasn't the media attention and the electronic media that there is today, but I'm sure that it was just as tough on DiMaggio as it was on Rose. I think it was tougher on Rose. Do you? Because, well, of, the because of television and the media attention. And they play things up more. The, coverage is so much larger. Right. Whereas DiMaggio might have five or six writers around. Pete Rose oftentimes would have 20, 25 members of the media. You know, Joe DiMaggio hit in, I believe, 61 consecutive games when he played for San Francisco in the Pacific Coast League. That's right. So he had some experience. <laughs> yeah, but Old Seal Stadium in San Francisco was not the major leagues. It was for a while when the Giants moved in. Ground ball to short. Okendo knocks it down, can't make the play. And will probably receive an error. It is being scored as an error. It's not an easy chance, and I believe the ball takes a bad hop on it. Let's take a look at it again. Right here, it stays down. Kendall charged with an error on the play. So both shortstops now have been charged with an error. First error in the ball game, charged for the Mets. And here's Terry Francona. Francona single to right. And then was forced as the front end of an inning ending double play back in the second. Ball one. Like in yesterday's game, 
Montreal with a lot of base runners. Runner going and a line drive. Backman caught it. It'll be an easy double play for the Mets as he throws to Hernandez. Well, a hit and run backfired here. Second double play turned in by the Mets. The other came with a base is shortstop. Salazar. Here it is again. Well hit ball by Francona, but taken in the air by Wally Backman. With the runner going, he gets an easy double play. So the error by Okendo erased. Two out, nobody on. And here's our heinous Salazar who popped out to Hernandez his first time up. Bloops one down the right field line. Strawberry coming hard. Can't get it. And a blue base hit for Salazar and Terrell has given up now eight hits. The majority of them have been of the blue or handle variety. In yesterday's game the Expos had 13 hits and they had a lot of those. So they are leading the league in hitting and getting a lot of help from the lucky side. But they all count. That's right. They look like ropes in the box score tomorrow. Charlie Lee grounded into a double play his first time up batting here with two out and Salazar at first 2 2 ball game goes after the high fastball and pops it up on the right side Backman has a play on it and makes it in foul territory and the inning is over a nice play by Wally Backman to end the fourth inning here at Shea and at the end of three and a half 2 2 between the Mets and Montreal now here's a word from manufacturers Hanover. Mets manager Davey Johnson in the dugout as the wind has picked up and the sky has clouded over here at Shea after sunshine to begin the ball game. And Davey Johnson's old ball club Baltimore having their troubles. The world's champions off to a two and eight start in last place and they're losing the day to Toronto after three and a half innings three to nothing. There you see the center field flag. A couple of innings ago, it was hanging limp in a dead calm here at Shea. Now, after a roll of thunder drifted by, the clouds have moved in and the wind has picked up. So, a threat of rain. And Hubie Brooks will lead it off here in the bottom of the fourth inning for New York. He'll be followed by John Gibbons and Walt Terrell. To face Charlie Lee. Out of Memphis, Tennessee. You know, he was originally drafted by the Mets. That's right, 1975. Didn't sign with the Mets and then later on signed with Lady the Montreal. Drafted, in fact, by two other clubs after the Mets in 76 and 77 and chose not to sign until he was drafted by Montreal. And he's been an outstanding pitcher for them. He'll be single to center his first time up. Was 0 for 3 yesterday, 1 for 4 in the series. Holds up, takes a ball outside, and the appeal down to first base umpire John Kibler goes for not so ball one. High fastball hit deep to left field. Rose going back. This ball could be. It is out of here. Into the bullpen. Home run, Gibby Brooks. Number two on the year for Hubert. And the Mets now lead three to two. It's a threat of rain. That lead is very important right now. And if you review the pitching sequence to Hubie Brooks, the first pitch, a curveball low and outside, and Hubie looked like he was looking for a fastball, and he gets it. And it's inside, and he's ready for it. And he hits it over the left field fence. And the Mets take the lead. Hubie Brooks last year had five home runs. This year, he has picked up his second. Last year, the Mets had three home runs off Charlie Lee, one by Foster and two by Heath. John Gibbons brings right through a fastball, strike one. As you see, Gibby hit by a pitch his first time up. Now with two homers and five RBIs. Two balls, one strike. John 
Gibbons picked up his first major league hit yesterday. Went one for three in the ball game. Now hitting 067. At this point in the season, a three for four day could change that drastically. That's right. <laughs> Good take as a few hits bunched together. On the inside corner, it's two and two. He hit 18 home runs for Jackson in the Texas League last year while hitting 298. Charlie Lee records his third strikeout. They've all come swinging, and there's one out here in the fourth. Mets pitcher. And here's Walt Terrell. Terrell. Walter, a strikeout victim, his first time up. Had a good shot at helping his own cause when he had a 3 0 count, but then struck out in a 3 2 fastball with runners at first and second. Your line That's of concession airs delight. They're being nice to him. <laughs> Delivered is a very nice word. It's downright slow. <laughs> Did you know, Ralph Kiner, that the longest professional, not major league, but professional baseball game in the history of organized baseball was played on this date in 1981? I think it ended 60 days later, didn't it? No, I think it ended the next day. If I'm not mistaken, I know it covered two days and 33 innings. And Pawtucket defeated Rochester three to two in 33 innings over a two-day period. And there's another strikeout. Two in the inning and four in the game for Charlie Lee. They played that game originally till four o'clock in the morning. How'd you like to explain to your wife where you'd been? <laughs> it was still two-two. And they played 31 or two innings, or 33 innings total. They resumed it the next day, and finally, in the 33rd inning, Pawtucket scored a run. It's like playing about four ball games back to back. Ball one to Backman. Wally has been on base twice, scored two runs. He doubled to left in the first on a blue pop-up. Reached on an air, stole second, and scored in the third. Ground ball to second. Little. And the inning is over. But one run on one hit by the Mets. Nobody left as Hubie Brooks homered to lead off the fourth inning. And we'll go to the fifth here at Shea, with the Mets now leading 3-2 to two over Montreal after this word from Getty. Well, it's the right news at the right time. It's News 9 prime time with Tom Dunn, Sarah Lee Kessler, Lloyd Lindsay Young in the weather, and Jimmy Myers with sports. Weeknights at 8, but tonight at 7.30 because of the NBA playoffs. That's right here on Channel 9. You know, talking about that longest minor league game, it started on April 18th, and it was completed 66 days later on June 21st. A player named Tom Eaton had 15 plate appearances. Gee whiz. And a guy named Russ, I believe it's LaRide, went 0 for 11 in that game. Well, your average could take a beating there, could it? There's Peter Edward Rose to lead off the fifth inning for Montreal. Rose 0 for 2 is grounded to first and grounded to the pitcher. Total game time was 8 hours and 25 minutes. Marathon. Actually, it's four marathons. <laughs> Marathon usually lasts about two hours and 15 minutes for the winner. You know, the Mets played the longest game ever played in time in the major league, That's seven right. hours, 23 minutes. It was against the San Francisco Giants in the second game of a doubleheader. The Mets also have played the longest game to conclusion, 25 innings. That was against the St. Louis Cardinals. And they have played the longest night game, 24 innings, against Houston. Longest major league game, a tie between Boston and Brooklyn, 26 innings. That's what happens when you have good pitching and 
Not enough offense. One and one, Rose. Two for four yesterday, two for six in the series. Two and one. Drive base hit center field. Pete Rose picks up his first hit of the day. He is now 186 hits away from Ty Cobb. And Pete Rose off to a good start this year. Gets his 15th hit of the season. And he can attributes his good start this year to a terrific physical program in the wintertime. He really pumps weights this winter. More so than in uh, years past. 4,005 hits for Pete Rose. Ninth hit in the ball game for Montreal, and here's Brian Little. 3,003 singles. Rose is running, and Little trying to protect him threw his bat at the ball, fouled it off. That's a good job by Little to protect Pete Rose. Rose is not fast. Never was, as a matter of fact. Yeah, you can't say Pete's lost any speed. He never had any. <laughs> <laughs> can't tell when you lose a step that way. <laughs> That's right. Philippe Alou, the first base coach for Montreal, retrieved the bat. Little, little one for two. Had a single to right back in the first inning, then was picked off. Tried to bunt, but Hernandez made a nice play to retire him unassisted in the third. Brian has four hits in six times up in this series. Seven, four for seven. And he fouls off another pitch, so it's 0 2. Oh, he's been on base a lot, hasn't he? Oh. Plays the game intensely. In the first minute he gets to the ballpark. Come out to the ballpark before the gates open, you'll sometimes and oftentimes see Pete Rose sitting in the dugout, fully dressed by himself. Check swing, loop to center, it'll fall in for a base hit. An 0-2 pitch. That little, you see Pete Rose congratulating him. Stopped his swing on and just looped it right into the center. Next a little leads the hit, the leg and hits with 41 now, and this is one reason why he didn't want to hit that ball, and he drops in for a base hit. Montreal, a hot ball club. They've been getting all kinds of hits. They now have 10 this afternoon. So runners at first and second with nobody out. And Tim Raines now the batter. Raines had a double and scored a run in the third. He flied to center back in the first. And he wants to drag one. It's a good bunt. Terrell will have to go to first base. And the ball hits Raines. Here comes Rose to score as the ball rolls out into right field. Little goes to third. It's 3 3. It and looks now like Range is interference. Being, he's being called out. The runners will have to go back. Range running outside of the base path that we were talking about earlier. You've got to run in the lane. You can see right there. And he was running inside toward the infield grass. Now we're having an argument with Davey Johnson. And we'll have to wait and see exactly what they've called. Kibler made the call, and now the home plate umpire, I believe, is going against him. And Kibler is saying, I'm going to call the play. He is the senior umpire of this group. Home plate umpire Lanny Harris is a newcomer to baseball. In fact, he was one of the scabs in baseball when the umpires went on strike. And now it's going to be Burden's turn to take it up with John Kibler. Well, you saw John Kibler signal out. Reigns is still standing on first base. Bird wants to find out what's going on. Kibler and Rose said, is coming out of the dugout to go back to, to second base. Runners have to go back. The batter is out. And now it's Lanny Harris arguing with Bill Burden. And it appeared that Lanny Harris disagreed with John Kibler. Kibler said, no, he's out. No, I think initially, Ralph, Kibler didn't make the call. And I think Lanny Harris said that he could see it better. No, he made the call. He made the call originally. He was the fellow that pointed right down and he gave the outside while you were watching Rose cross home plate. So well, for those of you who 
can read lips. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be one to three scoring it as Burton is really getting his two cents in, I'll guarantee you. Well, the main thing that umpires are supposed to do is to agree on a call. And if one umpire calls it one way and it's wrong, they're supposed to get together and come up with the right call. John Kibler showing Bill Verdon where Tim Raines was running in the base paths and why he's called out. Little will have to go back to second base. Rose will have, will have to go back to third. Let's take a look at it again and see if we can pick it up. A bunt attempt by Raines and Terrell fields the ball and throws to Hernandez. Hernandez is right on the back. And the ball hits Reigns, bounces away. See now where Reigns is? Inside. Yeah, yes. he was on the grass. He's inside the line. There's no doubt about it. You've got to run outside of that line, but inside the outside line on the far edge of the base pass. That's why they had they've drawn that lane in there. Reigns did not do that, and so he interfered. And they have made the runners go back to first and second. That goes with the call. That's automatic. Little at first, Rose at second. Reigns is out 1-3. The runners do not advance, and there's one out now in the inning. Great fielder, Andre Dawson. Bryn Smith right there, the winner of yesterday's ball game, as Bill Burden, who sel seldom shows expression either on the plus or minus side. Goes back to his post. And Andre Dawson, who's two for two with an RBI and a run score. Ball one. It's interesting to see how the players reacted. Reigns wouldn't leave first base. Rose wouldn't come out of the dugout. Ball two. When he finally did, he went to third base. Little stayed on second. And finally, they made him go back. Well, you know that Rose knows the rules. He was just trying to <laughs> pick up an extra 90 feet. A high fastball lined in the center field. Pookie up with it early. They're sending Rose. Here comes the throw to the plate. It's a good one, and Rose is out by a mile. A great job by Gibbons on Pete Rose, who tried to pull him over. Rose, who is known for trying to muscle catchers, and Gibbons doing a great job of taking Rose. Rose put Fossey out in the All-Star game, and a base hit by Hickman when he bowled over Fossey. Right here, he tries to do it to Gibbons, and the young rookie, youngest catcher in the National League, does a great job on Rose. Look at this. Now Rose is going to take him on. How about that? John Gibbons is one tough young man. We talked about him being hit by a pitch and in Chicago taking a foul tip and never showing any reaction either time. So Little moves around to third. Dawson with his third straight hit is at first base. The Mets still lead three to two as Mookie Wilson cuts down what would have been the time run. And Gary Carter takes a strike. Carter one for two, single to center back in the second, popped out to short. Two for six in the series. Ground ball foul. So Walt Terrell out in front, 0 and 2. Oh, you got to really admire John Gibbons on that play. I guess he knows what he's doing behind that plate. Demonstrated that in spring training. He's cool. He is. Didn't swallow his tobacco either. <laughs> that is important. There's Pete. And remember, Gibbons broke his cheekbone in spring training in a collision at home plate. And showed no fear there. Ball one, one ball, two strikes. Runners at first and third here in the top of the fifth inning. Two men out.
strikeout for Walt Carroll. And it couldn't have come at a better time for the New York Mets as the fifth inning for Montreal is over and the Mets still lead it three to two as we go to the bottom of the fifth. We'll be back after this word from Dotson. Dan Tenna investigates a counterfeit chip scandal. Yes, counterfeit potato chips, I'm sure. So don't miss any of the excitement as Robert Urich stars in Vegas tonight at 6 o'clock right here on Channel 9. Counterfeit chips in Vegas, I guess, would be poker chips. Well, let's look at the play at the plate. Dawson now singles to center field. Mookie charges the ball well. Rose starting from second is not fast. Good bounce here for Mookie and a perfect throw. Coming into home plate, Rose is going to try and bowl over John Gibbons, the catcher. Gibbons gets the ball in time and gets it into his bare hand, which helps him tremendously, and then spins Rose off to the ground. That kept the time run from scoring, and you look at John Gibbons. Betsy play by Gibby, and also, in addition to that, a fine throw by Mookie, who's been bothered by a shoulder problem in his throwing arm. So, Jose Okendo to lead off for the Mets here in the fifth inning. Mets leading by a score of 3 to 2. Okendo 0 for 2 against Charlie Lee, and the curveball for ball one. Kendall started this game hitting 172. And Charlie Lee with ball two. Mets have three runs on five hits. The Expos have two runs on 11 hits. And we're in the bottom of the fifth inning. Two balls and a strike. You know, even though Jose is 0 for 2 in the ball game, he did make a good play in the third inning with Wally Backman at first base after Backman had reached on an error. Okendo swung at a pitch that was way out of the strike zone to protect Backman, stealing second base, and it probably made the difference in Backman being able to get in there against Gary Carter. Backman later came around to score. A play that does not show up in the scorebook. And the slider is fouled off. So the count, two balls and two strikes. Well, Kendo made a bid for a base hit in the first inning when he hit a ball through the legs of Charlie Lee. But Salazar, the sec the shortstop, cut it off in back of the bag and threw him out. And the curveball hit in the air to center field. Tim Raines is there. One away. Charlie Lee has given up one big home That's run, and that was to Yubi Brooks that put the Mets on top three to two. That was back in the fourth. And he'll now pitch to Keith Hernandez, who singled in the first run of the ball game in the first inning. Keith one for two. Last ball, a call strike. Hernandez hit as long a single as you can possibly hit, 358 feet against the fence in right center. He was thrown out by Dawson on a perfect play at second base as he tried to make second. Run right through the fastball at strike two. Charlie Lee with excellent location on those two pitches, the first one hitting the outside corner and the second one coming inside to tie up Hernandez. Hernandez likes the ball away. He likes to serve that ball to left center. They play him straight away. Went after a breaking ball, and Hernandez is struck out on three pitches. That's Lee's fifth strikeout. Left fielder, George Foster. And it brings up George Foster. Ball going down, and Hernandez just unhappy with himself, I'm sure. Of course, he got in the hole, and the pitcher has a tremendous advantage at 0 2. Foster doubled in a run in the third inning. That tied up the game.
Pittsburgh defeated Philadelphia 6 to 3 today. St. Louis leading Chicago 5 0 in the bottom of the eighth. Atlanta and Cincinnati tied at four in the top of the ninth. And it's popped up. Second baseman Ryan Little makes the play, and the Mets go in order. And the score at the end of five the Mets three and the Expos two. Now, here's a word from Manufacturers Hanover. Just a reminder, due to an National Hockey League or National Basketball Association playoff game, we will not televise Friday night's Mets-Phillies game. Our next telecast will be Sunday at 1.30 p.m. against the Phillies in Philadelphia. We're going to the top of the sixth, a definite threat of rain. Mets leading by a score of 3-2, to two, and the leadoff batter will be Tim Wallach. Wallach won for two today to extend his hitting streak to 11 consecutive ball games. Leading off. He is hitting every game for Montreal this year. It'll be Wallach, Francona, and Salazar as the scheduled batters here in the top of the sixth inning. And the first pitch hit right at Okendo, and he takes the short hop and guns it over to Hernandez. So one pitch and one away. The first baseman, Jose. Francona. And he gets a nice hop, even though it was a short hop, since they just dragged the infield in the middle of the game. And that'll bring up Terry Francona. Francona, one for two. And the fastball for ball one. Francona, the son of Tito Francona who was a fine hitting ball player in the major leagues. One and one. Terry's last time up, he lined the ball sharply right at Wally Backman, who made a nice play to catch it before it hit the ground and was able to double up Tim Wallach. <laughs> Terrell has really had to work in this ball game. And corner with an idea of Running for a base hit, takes for ball two, two and one. Terrell has given up a total of 11 hits, but he has not walked a batter. Fastball fouled away. The Expos have had 24 hits in the first two games of this series. hit in the air to center field. Mookie Wilson is there. So two men away. Walt Terrell trying to pick up his third victory. Came into this game with an earned run average of 1.08. And he'll now pitch to Salazar. Salazar one for two. Looped a base hit to right field in the fourth inning. Arhenas Salazar. Fastball. He of the droopy eyes. Got great eyelashes. <laughs> you think it closes his eyes when oh, he swings? Oh boy, I doubt I it. Can't I can't mean, tell. He really. Uh, I guess that's the way he relaxes a little. And it's a foul ball. So a good play by Brooks, but foul. The ball foul. Salazar back to the plate, one and one. It was our director. Bill Webb, as we look at the foul ball, that discovered Fernando Valenzuela's rolling of his eyes up to the top of his eye sockets every pitch that he made. After that, everybody got on it, and it became part of his routine. Salazar, a fine fielding shortstop. Check swing foul ball, and it's one and two. It's amazing the facial expressions that hitters go through and pitchers in their concentration. Of course, everybody thinks of Steve Carlton with his 
exercising the facial muscles continuously. In the fastball, two and two. I think he started that when Tim McCarver was catching it. <laughs> Didn't like the pitches that were being called. <laughs> Making faces at Tim. <laughs> Here's a 2 2 pitch. Just did hit the slider off the end of the bat. Count stays at 2 and 2. They always said after Carlton and McCarver pass on to the great baseball team in the sky, they'd be buried 60 feet 6 inches from each other. <laughs> Fastball didn't get the corner. Goes to three and two. On deck batter, the pitcher, Charlie Lee. Well, let's hope for everyone's sake that Mr. Kiner or Mr. McCarver and Mr. Carlson are around a long time. Fly ball for Foster in left field. And the Expos, for the first time in this game, are retired in order. And the score at the end of five and a half innings, the Mets three and the Expos two. Now, here's a word from OTB. Well, we'd like to remind you that Strawberry Sunday will take place on the first Sunday of the season, April 29th, when the Mets meet the Phillies at 1.30 p.m. All fans will receive a free Strawberry Sunday and a salute to the 1983 Rookie of the Year, Daryl Strawberry. And what a perfect spot for a drop-in, as Daryl Strawberry is the leadoff batter for the Mets here in the bottom of the sixth inning. That'll be the first Sunday home game of the season. Well, the Mets haven't had many games at home. This is only their second home game. They have one tomorrow and then go on the road, taking on Philadelphia and Montreal before returning home. Strawberry in this game, a tough time. He was struck out on three pitches in the second, walked in the third. It'll be Strawberry, Mookie Wilson, and Hubie Brooks as the Mets' three batters scheduled in the sixth. Mets leading three to two, although they have been out hit 11 to five. A big hit in the game, a home run by Hubie Brooks to put the Mets ahead. Charlie Lee, the pitcher, and he starts off with a curveball. Cardinals have defeated Chicago 5 nothing. One ball, one strike. Strawberry, the rookie of the year last year, batted 257 with 26 home runs and 74 runs batted in. Started playing on May the 6th, Willie Mays' birthday. Ground ball to the first base side. The race to first base is won by Charlie Lee. Francona fielding the ball, shoving off to Lee, and that's one away here in the bottom Here's of the, the sixth inning. It brings up Mookie one. Wilson. Wilson. Well, you know, as we go along here in this ball game with a threat of rain and the game officially in the record book, if the game were to be canceled, it'll be interesting to see what Davy Johnson does, if anything, having a one-run lead under these circumstances. Should the Mets get some people on base. And that's ball one. Mookie has grounded out the two times he has been up. Third baseman Tim Wallach in on the grass to guard against the butt to the third base side. Two balls, no strikes. Something you don't see very often. Mookie taking two pitches in a row. <laughs> As you like to call him, Ralph, a Bible hitter. Thou shall not pass. Two and one. You walked a lot in your career. Obviously, you were walked intentionally quite often because of your home run threat. I averaged over 100 walks a season. And you were a selective hitter. You look for a pitch you could drive out of the ballpark. True. 
You know, one of the interesting things, and that's ball three, when Roger Maris hit 61 home runs, he did not receive an intentional walk all season long. That's hard to believe. Well, there was a reason for it. Why is that? Mickey Mantle was hitting behind him. <laughs> That wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? Mantle hit 54. Ground ball, base hit. So Mookie is on. And a good at bat for Mookie. Good job of hitting. Yeah, he saw five pitches. He doesn't see that many usually when he goes to the plate. He usually swings away and hits away. It seems that moving him down in the batting order has, and it, it seems like it would be the reverse, made him more selective. And now Hubie Brooks, the batter, he's two for two today. And the big hit, a home run in the fourth inning to put the Mets up three to two. Rookie, a definite threat to steal. He hasn't had many chances to steal. And he has no stolen bases. And he's chased back. Mookie last year had 54 stolen bases. But he was a leadoff batter last year. Carter has a gun for an arm, the catcher, and again a throw to first. The left-hander is Gary Lucas, acquired from San Diego. The right-hander, a former Met, Jeff Reardon. Well, after three head bobs, a throw to first base again. That's three throws over there. That's leading three to two, one out. We're in the bottom of the sixth inning. Buki does not go. A pitch out, and it's ball one. The crowd loves it because Muki bluffed going, and Carter pitched out. This is where it's tough on the hitter. It takes intense concentration here. It's tough on the watcher. <laughs> Under these circumstances, you are a watcher more than a hitter. But uh, Hubie has to really keep his mind on what he's doing. Throw to first base. If there's one good reason why ball games take much longer to play than they used to, it's because of the stolen bases and the throws to first base. That's a good point. The game has changed and speed has changed it. One of the ways it's changed is to make the game a little longer. Two balls, no strikes to Hubie Brooks. Charlie Lee obviously worried about Mookie Wilson at first. Two points of concentration, the home plate and the runner at first. There goes Mookie, and the ball is fouled off. Hubie had a good swing at a fastball, but fouled it off, and Mookie back to first base. Oh, you would want to have this fellow pitching on a getaway day. <laughs> Hold Miss that plane. plane. <laughs> miss your plane. If it were a charter, you'd miss, miss your plane. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he was taking his time before with Mookie at first, he's taking an inordinate amount of time now. Mookie running again. The pitch is missed. The throw is perfect. And Mookie is out. So Gary Carter with a gun for an arm throwing out Mookie Wilson at second base. And Carter's ability to throw him out is exemplified by the fact that Mookie Wilson gets a good jump here. He had almost four steps before the ball was delivered to the plate. And Carter puts that ball right there. Oh, he was safe. It looked like he got his hand in. He sure did. Salazar was up in front of the bag and had to sweep back with the tag. And after getting the count 2-0, oh, 
Hubie Brooks swings at a bad pitch and is struck out. Let's take a look at that attempted steal. Here goes Mookie in. This is from the ground level of the first base camera. Head first slide. Now watch his left hand if you can see it through the dirt. Did it get to the bag before Salazar put the tag on? As far as I'm concerned, it did, but then again, that's we're academic. a long way away. <laughs> and it is academic. <laughs> one hit and no one left on base, and the score at the end is six. The Mets three and the Expos two. Now a word from Bud Light. Robert Klein joins the cast of Crazies as Channel 9 turns your weeknights into Saturday night. Be watching tonight at 7 o'clock for the best of Saturday night right here on Channel 9. Robert Klein will fit into that cast pretty well. Pinch hitter for Charlie Lee here in the seventh inning for Montreal. It's going to be Miguel Delaunay, who's been around, started with Pittsburgh, went to Cleveland. And I'm kind of surprised they're pinch hitting for Charlie. He's going along quite well. I guess he's thrown enough pitches and coming back in. Tim McCarver. All right, Steve Zabriskie, Miguel Delaney, 29 years old from Santiago, Dominican Republic. He got a pinch hit for him now. Seventh inning, threat of rain, fastball to Delaney. Delaney batting 333 this year. He had 340 in 1980, 341 for the Cleveland Indians. Fastball is high, one and one. He can fly. Well, he can. 223 stolen bases in only 634 games. This is, he's 29 years old. This is his 13th year in professional baseball. Signed originally with those Buckos. Chuck Tanner told me there was concern about the Pirate organization when they decided to keep Omar Marino over Delaney. Eventually traded Delaney. You see how he chokes up, one and two. Swing and a miss, he got him. So a big strikeout for Walt Terrell, keeping that speed off the bases. Well, you don't want to put the tying run on, and when you can run like Delaney can, you'd, you're going to put anybody on. You don't want it to be him. And Delaney's biggest problem in professional baseball has been his hitting. Putting the ball in play on the ground. He had 61 stolen bases that year. He had 341 at Cleveland. Here's Pete Rose, one for three. Peter Edward Rose is hitting 10 of his 12 games started for the Expos this year. Rose in, uh, or Hubie Brooks at third in tight. And also guarding the line. Pete does not hit balls down the third base line. Oh, tight. Almost hit him. Two and up. There you see the defensive alignment. Were this a few years ago, that 186 hits he needs to tie Ty Cobb might be possible for Rose in one season. He had a lot of 200 hit seasons. To tie Cobb, right? To tie, tie. <laughs> <laughs> Three and out of Peter Edwards. They walked him on four straight pitches. And that only, well, that's the first walk, I should say, given up by Walt Terrell. The next and activity in the bullpen. Doug Sist for the Brian Mets gets up. There are a lot of leads that are comfortable in late innings. I would have to say this is an uncomfortable lead for Walt Terrell. The Expos have had 11 hits and only two runs. They've hit the ball hard throughout the first six innings. There's Doug Sisk. Here's Brian Little, two for three, five hits in the last two days against the Mets. Throw to first base. Rose is not going anywhere unless there's a hit and run play. Rose did not have a very big lead. Nice play Gibbons on a breaking ball. Carroll concerning himself needlessly with Rose now. He heard his windup or his from the stretch move there and has thrown five straight balls. And here comes Mel Stottlemyre, the pitching coach. A twofold reason now for Mel to be out there to give Sisk a chance to warm up and to talk to Terrell, the former, the most important. <laughs> well, I don't think that Davy Johnson will wait any longer than he has to to make the change here with the one run lead 
And as you said, Tim, in, a, in an excellent point, Walter has not been in control of this ball game. This is not to look at the score three to two, a typical three to two ball game with 11 hits. He's only struck out two. That second one coming on Delonay pinch hitting here in the seventh. And in fairness to Walt, also a lot of the hits have been the, of the swift variety, but nonetheless they've been hits. A lot of people on base. Big play in the game, a throw from Mookie Wilson. Back in the fifth inning to nail Rose at the plate. A nice play by John Gibbons. First time he's been contested at home, making a play since that Joe LaFay play in spring training. There's a strike one and one. Joe LaFay of the Phillies came up with an elbow, fracturing the cheekbone of John Gibbons, as you said earlier, Steve. Strawberry too deep and right. Wilson and Foster shallow. Wind blowing in from right field. Tap to first. Hernandez goes to second base on a nice play. Boy, I'll tell you, you watch him every day and you really are thrilled and delighted to see him plays that no other first baseman would make. You're not kidding. You talk about the epitome of the gold glove. Keith Hernandez, and that also includes his ability to throw the baseball. I don't remember him making a bad throw. Makes the 3-6-3 three, three double play as though it were routine, and on a play that no other first baseman goes to second, just nips Rose at second. Had he not thrown down there, he would have been the tying run in scoring position. Reigns one for three, a double back in the third inning, and he scored a run. 3-2 ball game. We're in the seventh. Fastball is high. 1-0. and One thing you do not have with Reigns batting third, you don't have the runners in front of him that are fast, especially Pete Rose. Little runs a little. <laughs> Had 12 stolen bases last year. I really don't understand Bill Burton's thinking in batting Reigns third and Rose first. No, I don't either. To me, it would make more sense to have Reigns leading off and have Pete behind him. He handles the bat well. Ground ball, foul ball. And you know, the Expos have a lot of guys who can bat third. You got Dawson, you have Carter, you have Wallach. Even Francona can hit Francona, third. excellent third place hitter against right handed pitching. By the way, 11,631 total, 11,147 paid today. Watch the bulldog tenacity of Walt Terrell. One and one to Reigns. Two out, seventh inning. Throw to first, little sliding back, diving back, I should say. Well, as the season goes along, talking about the Montreal lineup, it'll be interesting to see if. A change is made. Of course, with the success they're having lately. Ball hit well right field. Way back. Out of here. Expos lead four to three. And it can happen just like that as it did. Second home run of the year for Timmy Rain. For well, Walt Terrell dancing through raindrops on a threatening day. All day long, the 12th hit for the Expos, and they now have a one-run lead. And here comes Davey Johnson. And the change is going to be made now. And the Rock got all of this ball. Hit it to the base of the scoreboard in right center field, well over the 370-foot mark, close to 400 feet. And just like that, the Expos, with that two-run home run, have taken the lead now four to four. Reigns batted only 217 with one home run and five RBIs last year. This year, not only is he batting 370, but he has two home runs and 10 RBIs. So it's now a 4-3 ball game. The Mets have their work cut out for them. And another thing you have to remember is the rain is threatening. Well, while the change is being made, Let's run down the scoreboard for you, and there are some other day games today, a couple of which have been completed. 
Pittsburgh defeated Philadelphia six to three in Pittsburgh. Candelaria the winner. He's two and one. Robinson picked up his second save. And Kuzman took the loss. He's one and two. St. Louis behind Joaquin Andujar shut out the Chicago Cubs five to nothing on five hits. Andujar going the distance, picking up his second victory. He's now two and one. And uh, David Green had a home run for St. Louis, his second of the year in the eighth with one man on. Chuck Rainey, the loser, he's one and two. And they're playing the second game of that doubleheader, LaPointe against Sanderson. Number 39, Doug. Atlanta and Cincinnati are tied 4-4 in the 10th inning of play. Barker and Soto, the starters there, they are long gone. Bedrosian pitching in the ninth for Atlanta. Hume has come in now the top of the 10th to pitch for Cincinnati. Claudel Washington with two home runs in that ball game, A solo shot in the first inning and a three-run blast in the second to account for all of Atlanta's runs. So they're in the 10th inning tied 4-4. San Diego at San Francisco has been postponed by rain. Over the American League, Toronto seven to nothing over Baltimore in the bottom of the seventh inning. Palmer started for Baltimore, was relieved by Underwood in the sixth. Steeb pitching for Toronto and leading seven nothing bottom of the seventh inning. The rest of the schedule in the National League tonight will have Los Angeles at Houston. And of course that San Diego San Francisco game has been rained out. In the American League, the Yankees are at Cleveland tonight, Oakland at Seattle, Texas at Boston, Kansas City at Detroit, and California will be at Minnesota. So Doug Sis, the new pitcher. Doug was in yesterday's ball game, his sixth appearance of the year. He has not allowed an earned run. He and Jesse Orozco have not allowed an earned run no, in 12 and a third oh, innings of pitching. Right fielder, Andre Dawson. So Walt Terrell goes six and two thirds gives up four runs on 12 hits strikes out two walks one and the book is closed on Walt for today he stands to be the losing pitcher and cannot win this game now. and Charlie Lee stands to be the winner should the Expos not yield the lead or should the Mets not tie the lead before the game's over Andre Dawson three for three an RBI and a run score. came into this game everybody but Dawson and Salazar were hitting well over 300 Dawson was three for three and put him right up around the 260 mark fastball tap foul two and one to Andre Dawson it's not unusual to see Doug Sis come in and throw ball one ball two he has such a moving fastball, and as we mentioned yesterday, Ralph Kiner said it very appropriately, swing and a miss. As you saw the movement on that fastball, his, his wildness is caused by his control problems. Or, <laughs> boy, that's a great statement. Thank you, Yogi. Thank you. Boy, what a great statement <laughs> that was. His problems with the control caused by his fastball, and there's one in the dirt, three and two. <laughs> I knew it was in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. That's why once in a while you'll see if Sist has this problem and throw a few breaking balls in an effort to get himself squared away. Check swing, foul back. <laughs> <laughs> his problems with wildness are caused by his control. Mm, that might go down. Glad I corrected that in a hurry. <laughs> I like you're it. You're going to just let me die, weren't you? No, I was <laughs> trying to figure out what you were trying to say. <laughs> Swing and a miss. This does the job by getting Dawson. But it's after the fact as the Expos score two runs on one hit. Very costly walk to Pete Rose. No errors and nobody left. At the end of six and a half, it's now the Expos four and the Mets three. Well, fans, the best way to enjoy Mets baseball is with 1984 season tickets. With the home opener late, they come to Shea and select from the choice seat locations that are still available on a season basis. With season tickets, there's no waiting on lines. You maintain the best seats for big promotional days, and you'll receive a substantial discount from the regular per-game ticket price. Best of all, you're near the action all year as the young Mets battle their National League opponents. If you don't want the full season ticket plan, there are plenty of smaller ticket plans from which to choose. So take advantage 
of the best sports buy in town and call for further information. Dial 212-507-TIXX. 507-TIXX. And tr please try to call sometime between Monday and Friday, 9.30 to 5.30. Well, Montreal has a new pitcher in the person of Jeff Reardon, ex-Met. That's right. Reardon, who's been tough on his ex-teammates, making his fifth appearance of the season. Of course, they have all been in relief. And uh, he has no record nor any ERA because in six innings of work, he is not allowed an earned run. He already has picked up two saves, given up six hits, excuse me, only one hit in his six innings of work. He has hit a batter, walked three, and struck out five. So Reardon has gotten off to a pretty fast start this year, and he is on in an effort to save this game for Charlie Lee with the Mets batting here in the bottom of the seventh. Uh, Daryl Thomas will be batting ninth. He has replaced Pete Rose in left field. So he is inserted to the nine hole. And Reardon will be batting number one. With Dawson making the last out. And LeGrand Orange is going to be the pinch hitter for catcher John Gibbons. Rusty Staub, I would imagine. Well, he's going to be the pinch hitter for the pitcher. John Gibbons being allowed to bat for himself. I'm thinking maybe Danny Heath would be in there in the number nine slot. But John Gibbons being allowed to hit for himself. And this is what Davey's trying to do, huh, Steve? And I really, uh, as you look at Ed Lynch in the Mets bullpen, I really agree with his philosophy. He's going to let these guys play. And really, you have to, because when you consider the fact Gibbons is coming from double-A ball. The more major league pitching he sees, the better opportunity he's going to have to get himself squared away and get himself where he can be as a major league player offensively. And the same holds true for Jose Oquendo and, and the other young players. Unless the situation really mandates pinch hitting. Good word. Davey's going to let them hit for themselves and get that experience. Appropriately said. Gibbons 0 for 1. He was hit by a pitch and he struck out. Fastball is high from Jeff Reardon, 28 years old, from Dalton, Mass., lives in Palm Beach, 6'1", 200 pounds, traded for Ellis Valentine, May 29, 1981. Dan Norman, an outfielder, also went over to the Expo. Swing and a miss, a high rider. Versus the Mets since the trade. Reardon one and three with four with four saves. That was last year. Three and three, ten saves lifetime. One and three last year. Fastball fouled out of play down the right field line. One and two to John Gibbons. Four to three ball game. We're in the seventh. Arming, dropping down, and the fastball misses high. Reardon, the type of pitcher that you would prefer to get the ball down. That ball up really hops. Swing and a miss. He got him on the high rider. First strikeout for Jeff Reardon, and seventh in the game to the Expo. And here's Rusty Stock. Well, this is the first time that Gibbons has ever seen Jeff Reardon. And with a pitcher of Reardon's capabilities, that's a mismatch. Of course, you can virtually say that about everybody, everybody he's facing. That's right. First time, of course. Which is another reason for having him hit for himself as much as possible. Rusty stop, two for four, both pinch hits. Swinging a high fastball, he takes, I should say. One and oh. Rusty was 8 for 15 against the Expos last year in pinch hitting appearances. And 1 for 1 this year. Fastball is high, 2 and up. 
Rusty Staub, who won the last game of the season against these Expos, off of Jeff Reardon with a double that hit the fence in right field, driving in two runs. There's a strike. Charlie Lee, incidentally, pitched six innings, gave up three runs on six hits, struck out six, walked one, and hit a batter. And as we mentioned, fans to be the winning pitcher. It hits it well, but Timmy Raines in center field makes the catch. So Staub hit it well, but right at Timmy Raines, and they're two away. Yeah, Rusty gets a big hand for virtually everything he does here at Chase Stadium. Every time he's seen, there's a reaction from the crowd. And that's really the case in many of the ballparks around the National League. Rusty's popular not only here, but just about everywhere. Not unlike Pete Rose, who always gets a reaction. Only Pete's is usually the opposite kind. Out of respect, Wally Backman, short hop to Salazar, the shortstop, and Reardon has an easy inning. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. At the end of seven, the Expos four and the Mets three. Now a word from Bud Light. Well, the new pitcher for the New York Mets will be Ed Lynch. Now you see Eddie with no record in an ERA of 4.26. His fourth appearance of the year. He's finished one game previously. He's pitched six and a third innings. Given up eight hits, three earned runs. As you see, walked four, struck out three, and has yet to record a save. Used primarily in middle relief so far this season. As a well-dressed Mets fan, Eddie has three appearances so far this year. His last appearance against the Cubs, the 14th, which was last Saturday. Pitched two innings and allowed a home run to Leon Durham. He has three no decision appearances this year, this being his fourth. Last year, Ed, 10 and 10, pitched in 30 games, 27 of which he started. Unusual position to put Eddie in, and he's handled it very well. Yes, he has. Unusual in that most guys would complain and kick around and what have you. Not so Ed Lynch or Craig Swan, for that matter. Not only have they both handled it well, they both pitched well. Swanee's been used sparingly, coming in for an inning here and there, and most of the time has gotten the side out in order. So, four to three ball game, leading off the Expos here in the eighth inning is Gary Carter. Single back in the second, he's one for three. Gary told me before the game that Pete Rose has made a world of difference being on the ball club by lifting the pressures off of the backs of Reigns, Dawson, and Carter. Fastball strike. Now they've got somebody else who's going to receive the brunt of the media attention. Especially Gary. That's right. Gary is a hyper individual, very intent competitor. A little cue shot, foul ball, 0 and 2. Sometimes you really need to take a second breath and look around. A lot of times you have tunnel vision as a player when you're a good competitor and you think you have to do all the work. And Pete certainly can allay some of that heat. Two to Carter. Third base, Brooks is going to have to hurry. And he guns him out. Good play by Hubie Brooks, who is playing Carter deep, and there's one away. At the plate, third base. Well, the batter, Tim Wallach, he has been red hot. Base hit RBI in the second inning, on on an error in the fourth and grounded the short sharply in the sixth. He is really locked in, isn't he? 11 games in a row, he's hit safely. All 11 games so far this year. Interesting shot there from Bill Webb, our director, from our center field camera. Look how the front part of the body, that's like Flamini used to hit. Bottom part is outside, but the shoulder's locked. Swing and a miss. And then he Good steps cut. in. Uh -huh. Steps in toward the plate as well as toward the pitcher. That front shoulder is pointed. That is the key for most good hitters. 
that front shoulder. Once it leaves, the top of the body leaves, and you're dead. Slightly open stance. Now, what, look at that front shoulder. Really locked in there. Taps this one foul. One and two to Tim Wallach. Wallach won the Golden Spike Award in 79 as the top amateur player of the country with Cal Fullerton. 1980, Terry Francona won it at Arizona State. Fastball misses two and two. The Expos have done some excellent drafting and have built their ball club through the farm system. And a credit to them because they've been contenders for about eight years. That's right. Since 77. Which means that they're going to get, they're going to have to draft lower in the draft. Right. They don't get a lot of right. first round picks. The Mets have rebuilt their farm system because they've had a lot of high round draft picks or low round draft picks. We're going to look at it, but within the first three rounds. Rip to third. Nice play, Hubie Brooks. He guns him out. Looked like on your monitor there, like a routine play, but an extremely difficult play by Brooks. This is the kind of ball that eats up infielders sometimes. Sharply hit. Watch that wicked last hop. But Hubie, with the soft hand, stays right with it, cushions that ball up rather than fighting it, and then takes the time to set himself and throw. He had some time because the ball was so sharply hit. Not enough has been said about the improvement of one Hubie Brooks. Here's Francona. Line drive off the handle, the right field. It falls in there. First hit off Ed Lynch. And the second for Francona, who's hit the ball well all four times today. Tough hitting lineup, isn't it? I'll tell you, all the way down, one through seven. And if Salazar comes around, it'll really be something. Salazar one for three, a looping base hit back in the fourth inning. See how Gibbons came up on that ball? That's what running will do for you. Francona, only a mile threat to run, but by doing that, you take pitches away from the umpire. Block his vision just at the critical moment. One and one to Salazar. The first seven hitters, with the exception of Dawson in the Montreal lineup, hitting well over 300. And Dawson with his three hits today, three for four, is going to inch up there. Closer. I guess simply put, in a running situation, a catcher should go take the one step down while he's still down on the ground as opposed to coming up. Bobble by Okendo, but he recovered in time to make the force. For the Expos in the eighth, no runs, one hit, no errors and one left at the end of seven and a half. They have the lead. Four to three. And now a word from Dotson. Well, excuse me, Steve. Sorry. Bottom of the eighth inning. And the Mets are sending up pinch hitter Danny Heap, Keith Hernandez, and George Foster. And we're sending in Steve Zabrisky. Thank you very much, Timmy. Got you on your front foot then, didn't I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was off stride. Pull the strings on you. <laughs> give, me, give me the old backup ball there. Anyway, Heap's going to uh, pinch hit, and Danny is hitting 250 so far this year with three hits and 12 times up. He's been up as a pinch hitter three times with one base hit, hitting 333 then as a pinch hitter. Heap hitting for Okendo against Jeff Reardon here in the eighth inning. It'll be followed by Keith Hernandez and George Foster as the Expos lead four to two. The big blow, Timmy Raines' two-run home run that turned a 3-2 Mets lead into a 4-3 deficit. Heap was a pinch hitter in yesterday's ball game and singled. Slider misses inside. Danny Heap's probably wishing that starter Charlie Lee were still in there. He had two pinch hit home runs against him last year. And a strike on the inside corner. Heap can't believe it. The first pitch looked to be closer to being a strike than that one, but it's one and one. his kneecap. Breaking ball inside. Two and one. That's 
why you're more inclined to throw the pitch that the pitcher can get over with an even count. One, one, two, two. Because if you fall behind, the hitter's going to be looking for the fastball, and he will get it here. And he got it on the outside corner, two and two. Nasty spot. Hitters look for pitches, but they also look for them in a certain area. Well, and, and, and right now, 2-2, two, two, there's still an element of doubt. If he misses with a curveball and goes to 3-2, there's no more doubt. Base hit left field. So Danny Heath keeps the Mets pinch hitting alive. Coming into this ball game over the last two games, the Mets pinch hitters were 4 for 5. So they're 1 for 2 in this ball game. Five for seven. Good pizza hitting by Danny Heath. The Mets pinch hitters, by the way, are five for their last seven. Four for five coming into this game. He base hit by Danny Heath. He did it all all year last year. Continued this year as that rusty stop. So now Keith Hernandez one for three, a single and an RBI in the first inning. He's also fly to left and struck out. Batting with Heath at first base and nobody out. Keith representing the tying run. I mean, Heath representing the tying run. Foul ball. Nice play by Francona, but a foul ball. Called immediately by John Kibler. Outstanding play by Francona. But it was a foul ball. Francona can catch foul balls like that. What can he do with fair balls? <laughs> huh? Pretty good glove man right there. Terry Francona made a nice play, but it was just foul. So one strike to count on Hernandez. Let's have the tying run aboard with nobody out and Reardon with a little token throw to first. I don't think you'll see the Mets hit and run unless the count evens up with Hernandez. Probably the best bat control in the National League. Because then you, there's a chance for a pitch out right now because it's a, a pitcher and a catcher have a free pitch. But an even count, they don't, because if they pitch out, it runs the count in the hole. He was not going. The pitch is fouled off, and it's 0-2. So now the possibility of a hit and run diminished even further. Dick Grote used to tell me the best hit and run count was one ball and two strikes. When you think about it, that's probably the best count where a pitcher and a catcher want to finish off a hitter. So you're more apt to get more strikes in that situation. That's a good point. Hernandez fouls off the two strikes now. It's a repro game. It really is. Marvelous game. And as you've said so often, there are so many ways that you can play it in every situation. And then the situations change with every pitch. When you think about it, there are probably 500 things that can happen every time that ball's thrown. Way inside, one and two. That's one of them. <laughs> and a good pitch by Reardon, knocking Hernandez to back away from the plate. You gotta do that. You gotta keep that outside part of the plate fresh. Well, you said he that. had a free pitch, and instead of using it for a pitch out, he used it for a breezer. Well put. Fly ball left field. Fairly deep, but Thomas has a beat on it, and Daryl makes the catch. I've always thought they should check Daryl Thomas's glove to see if it's legal. It looks like it's the longest glove I've ever seen. That is when he's playing the outfield. Yeah. Right? He, can, uh, he can play anywhere. He has played anywhere. He's played all eight positions. He's even caught. As you see, Foster had an RBI double back in the third inning. He's also flying to left and popped out to second. His double was a smash down the line into the left field corner. And there's Jesse Orozco up and throwing with bullpen coach Vern Hoshite. I believe the last guy to play all nine positions in the major leagues was Burt Campanero. I think you're right. Can't be pitched one inning. Strike one to Foster. of the eighth, four, three, Montreal, one out. And a ground ball to short. It could be a double play. It's a little for one, and in time at first base, 
as Reardon gets out of it, getting a double play ball from Foster after Heath had led off the inning with a single. So the Mets lose a chance to at least tie the game here in the eighth. We'll go to the ninth with Montreal leading by one. Now here's a word from Manufacturers Hanover. They're into the ball game, replacing Jose Okendo, who was pinch hit for in the previous inning. Guardy will play shortstop and bat second in the order should the Mets get to that point in the batting order. And Ed Lynch will work his second inning of relief as the third Mets pitcher of the afternoon. He'll be pitching to Daryl Thomas and in the pitcher's spot. Number one in the order, Jeff Reardon scheduled up second, and then Brian Little. It has done everything here at Shea but rain. Well, you're right. <laughs> We've had thunder, but no rain. Very ominous-looking day, and has been since the fourth inning. Threatening, but it's, and it's all around us, but not here at Shea. As you see, Thomas, no hits in five at bet so far this season. Breaking ball and a good one from Lynch for strike one. But that's because the good Lord protects ballparks. On occasion, yes. That is correct. Fastball outside, one and one. 4-3, <laughs> Montreal leading here in the top of the ninth. And strike two. Looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth, the Mets will have Strawberry, Wilson, and Brooks as the three hitters. Scheduled up. Thomas signed as a free agent in the winter of 83, an outstanding ball player. Excellent speed, good hitter, good defense. Foul outside of third. The count holds at one and two. Thomas known for his basket catches in the outfield with that huge glove. That did not enamor him to too many Dodger officials. Tommy Lasorda won. And one of the few players to wear that number 13. Davey Concepcion is the one that comes to mind. I know of no other in the National League. I can't Off think of anybody right now. No. Up and under the chin, and it's two and two. The Astros was traded to San Diego in 72 for Dave Roberts. And ball four. So Thomas works Ed Lynch for a walk to lead off the ninth inning as the Expos look for some insurance. And Ed Lynch, of course, wants to keep this game right where it is to give his ball club an opportunity to win it in the bottom of the ninth or at the very least tie it up. And Jeff Reardon will bat for himself. Just in case the Mets do tie it up in their half of the game. Good at bat by Thomas. He fell in the hole one and two to Ed Lynch. Worked him for a walk after fouling off a couple. And he misses the bunt outside. Strike one. You know, that's a good pitch, especially with Hernandez at first base. Keith talking to Ed Lynch. A slider away is more apt to be bunted toward the first base than anything away, but especially a slider because of the spin. And with Hernandez charging, you'd rather see if the ball bunted to him. There are three, ten, three things that Hernandez tells Lynch. He says to throw home. Otherwise, when I break, step off. That prevents Thomas from running. Or throw to first base. That'll prevent him from running. Fouled off as Reardon, again, had to bunt that slider on the outside part of the plate and did not do a good job of getting his bat out there in the first place. See, in order to bunt the slider toward third, you almost have to have your bunt point, your bat pointed toward first base. And most guys want to bunt the ball to first base anyway. So the slider makes you more inclined to do it, and you're playing right into the defense's hand with a guy like Hernandez at first base. Right. And Keith, of course, hoping for a play at second base to keep Thomas from advancing. Thomas, remember, runs very well. And he bunts it foul right down home plate. So Reardon is out. A strikeout credited to Eddie Lynch. His first fourth in the ball game by the Mets. One out here in the ninth. And Brian Little, who ought to know how to bunt, is the batter. <laughs> I don't know the sign. Hey. Give it to me again, will you? 
You turn around too quick. What do you want me to do? I mean, that said everything. <laughs> That's right. They're in a hit and run situation. Little puts the bat on the ball. He struck out only two times in 58 at bats. Last year, he struck out only 22 times in 350 at bats. The epitome of the contact hitter. Takes the ball outside. Little single to right back in the first, rounded to first on a bunt attempt in the third inning, singled to center in the fifth, and reached on a field of his choice and scored in the seventh. He scored ahead of Tim Raines' home run. That is the difference in this ball game. Down low, two and zero. Oh. a cerebral game and you're looking at a cerebral guy. Two and one. A little intently watching third base coach Rush Nixon. drive to right strawberry makes the catch Thomas back the first two away so here comes the rock Tim Raines two for four a double and a run scored in the third and a two run home run to put the Expos out in front in the seventh He's also applied to center and grounded back to the pitcher. <laughs> Thomas might have been going that time. Yes, sir. You're exactly right. And he, Lynch stepped off. Off. he almost balked. He stepped off when he saw Thomas leaning. Thomas about fell down. <laughs> he <laughs> put the brakes on in a hurry. <laughs> Talk about getting caught in between. Thomas is not running now. Reigns takes it for a ball. Put a couple of divots in the base pads there. Way outside, and a nice stop by Gibbon. Two balls, no strikes. Incidentally, looking back to Rain's home run, that was the first home run given up by Terrell this year. Runner going, pitch is low, and the throw is high, but he's out. Nice throw by John Gibbons. It was high because he had a lot on it. And he throws out Daryl Thomas to end the ninth inning for Montreal. So the Mets will go to the bottom of the ninth, needing one to tie right after this word from Bud Light. Well, the Mets are going to try and come from behind here to win their first ball game at home after losing 10 to nothing to Montreal yesterday in the home opener. The Mets had the lead going into the seventh at three to two, but Timmy Raines with a two run home run made it 4 3 Montreal. And the Mets will have some guys that could do it Daryl Strawberry, Mookie Wilson, and Hubie Brooks to bat here in the ninth inning. Jeff Reardon working his third inning in relief of Charlie Lee. And Darrell gets a big hand from the 11,000 on hand here. Strawberry with three home runs against the Expos last year, two off Ray Bur Burrett and one off Bren Smith, the starter and winner of yesterday's game. Strawberry is 0 for 6 in this series, however, as he takes the strike. He's walked back in the third inning. He's also struck out and grounded to first. Rips base hit right field. Dawson fires the ball in, and the Mets have the tying run aboard with nobody out here in the ninth inning. Second time in two innings they've had that 
tying run aboard. Danny heaped a pinch single in the eighth. And I'm telling you, if he'd have gotten this one up, it'd have gone all the way back to the city. I'll tell you. Woo! Smoked it. So Darrell at first base with, of course, excellent speed. Mookie Wilson, the batter now. Mookie one for three, had a single to right in the sixth, but was caught stealing. He's grounded out his two other times up. Two for seven in the series. I don't know if I'd bun here. You got Rusty Staub and Danny Heap out of the ball game. Two right-handers coming up and Mookie Wilson hitting. I don't know if I'd bunt in this situation. And they're not, but it's popped up to short left center field. Tim Raines calling for it and one away. And Davey took a, I thought, a worthwhile chance and ended up empty. If you bunt, you're depending on a base hit by Brooks and Gibbons, and you got to remember that Gibbons has only gotten one base hit in his major league career. Yubi Brooks struck out his last time up, but he's two for three. He singled the center in the second and homered to left field back in the fourth inning that gave the Mets a temporary lead. Sometimes you just get wrong results for right reasons in this right. game. Got to do what you think is best under the circumstances, right or wrong, regarding the results. Carroll didn't have a very big lead either time. But Reardon just letting him know he's there. Pitch out. Strawberry not going. Just got their pitch out right there with a the man on first base. Anytime Carter flails, fires down three fingers, one, one, one. That's a pitch out, as opposed to the perennial fist for a pitch out. The Expos are well versed in keeping runners close. Probably well versed by pitching coach Galen Cisco and also by Gary Carter. Fastball is high. Two balls, no strike. That's the problem with that pitch out. Now he's in the hole 2 0. Hubie's homered once today. Can he do it again? He'll have a fastball that's hit, I believe. No way he'll throw him a 2 0 breaking ball. Take a chance of running the count 3 0. It's a fastball away. Swung right through it, two and one. Signs from the catcher right into your living room. That's folks. right. The fastball wasn't away though. I thought Carter was signaling for it to be outside. He just, he just threw it. Here's a <laughs> fastball just throw it. That's it. <laughs> Don't give me that away stuff. Here it comes. Some dead red. Two and one. Foul back into the screen. Two and two. One out here in the bottom of the ninth inning. The Mets have the tying run on. Yubi Brooks representing the winning run at home plate. Yubi struck out on a breaking ball his last time up after the home run. He'll probably get another breaking ball here. You saw three fingers. Oh, and he went for a very bad pitch. Reardon records his second strikeout. Uh, Hubie, with only 31 walks last year, a very aggressive hitter, especially with two strikes. And now it's up to John Gibbons. You saw the grimace of anguish on Hubie's face, and Gibbons has struck out twice and been hit by a pitch. But if you're going to get your second major league hit, this would be a good time to do it. Ron Hodges is on deck to pinch it. As the pitcher is scheduled up next, strike one. Strike two. The Mets down to the last strike here. No two count with two out. Young hitter, you're in a situation where you want to get beat on your best pitch. He swung through two, and I would think Carter will throw the call for the high mustard again. You see the turn over the fist? That means throw over there. So Gary Carter is behind all of that. 
Now we know. Wait till tomorrow, Gary. We'll know all this stuff. <laughs> We're not televising tomorrow. Might be a pitch out here. Remember the last yeah. time he flashed 3-1? Three 3-1. One? Three the pitch out. Reardon doesn't want to throw it. He wants to get the game over with. Let's go through it again, he said. Be a fastball away. Foul back as Gibbons just stays alive. Gibbons was right on that pitch, just underneath it. Of course, if Gridden's a writer, it's not too hard to get underneath it. Not a good time to pitch out. You want to go for the out. Eckwood taking a chance on Strawberry. I mean, it's 0 2. Take a chance on Strawberry going to second base. Let's see what Gibbons, or what Carter calls. Breaking ball, the same pitch that struck out Hubie, and Gibbons does not go for it. He wanted that slider way outside, and he got it. One ball, two strikes on 21 year old John Gibbons. Carter's got more hand signals than a traffic cop. Tell him. Fastball. Popped up, but out of play behind home plate. Still one and two. One thing for Gibby, he's hanging tough here. He's fouled off a couple of pretty good pitches. This might be a good time for Strawberry to run. You follow the pattern. Three straight fastballs, a breaking ball away that Gibbons held off. Now he fouled back to fastball. Good time to run. He'll probably come back with a breaking ball. Up and in, almost hit him. Strawberry running the throw is high and Darrow safe. Gibbons just getting out of the way of that up and in pitch. Good play by Daryl Strawberry. That pitch was too high to Gibbons and too high to Salazar. Daryl under the, the desperation tag of Salazar. Get down. All right. Two and two. Too high, ball three. And many of the fans who started to leave are standing in the exits here at Shea now. As we build to some drama here in the bottom of the ninth. By the way, Strawberry second stolen base in three attempts. Hodges, the on-deck hitter, should Gibbons continue things. Ball four. talk about a great at bat by John Gibbons. You mentioned yesterday that a couple of hits would get him out of it. That at bat right there does more for maturing a young man than any at bat in the world. 0 oh and 2. He went through the first two pitches. Now watch this pitch. That ball's a ball inside. Now watch Reardon. What? Why not? <laughs> that ball was inside, Jeff. Galen Sisko, the pitching coach, has come out to the mound now. For a little discussion, no one has been throwing in the Montreal bullpen. I wonder, Timmy, if they're discussing whether to walk Hodges and pitch to Backman, what? which wouldn't make any sense, but what nah. else are they talking about? Nah, you just, the old standard cliche, just hang, you know, hang with them, relax, and all that stuff. You're in here, win or lose, or save or lose. No way they're talking about that. They're talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's the only thing I can think of. A walker, a guy load the bases, get a play at any base, and pitch to Backman. No, man. There's no righty lefty involved. Backman's a switch hitter. And get, yeah, and get Givens down to second base for the winning run? Ain't no way. They do that. Guy needs his head examined. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I have to think, but I don't know what else they're talking about all that time. That's it. The old hang with them, let's go, relax, and all that stuff. Pitching coach in that situation shouldn't even go out there. That's your point. It's properly taken. Ron Hodges has been 
effective as a pinch hitter, and he takes a ball from Reardon. The Mets have the tying run at second, the winning run at first base, two out here in the bottom of the ninth. Ronnie had his first pinch hit of the year, first hit in Chicago, ground ball off of Lee Smith up the middle. One and one. Had a good hack at that, didn't it? Hodges one for two as a pinch hitter. Adding 222 on the year. Yeah, he does have two hits. He had a hit as a starter down in Atlanta. My mistake. thing in favor of the Mets now the outfield is deep they have to play deep because Hodges has a little extra power that'll give strawberry an extra stride as you see your outfield strike two two and two should he get a base hit to the outfield now you have two strikes on the hitter two outs you run if the guy on second thinks the ball is a strike he takes off same with the guy on first two 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 strikes, two out. That'll give you another extra stride and a half. Get that jump. So once again, the Mets down to one strike, as was the case with Gibbons, who worked out a walk. A 2 2 pitch coming to Hanji. And now Ronnie steps out. What a great ball game. Just about something for everybody this afternoon. Inside, and the count is full. Now the runners will be off. Gibbons with not blazing speed, but he has average speed. He's not slow. He throws anything but a fastball here. I'm buying you dinner, pal. All Next right. chance. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> runners go, ball four. They walk Hodges to get the back. <laughs> well, you know he wasn't pitching around him, but he walked him nonetheless. And now the signal comes from the bullpen that whoever's warming up down there, Gary Lucas, who was up earlier, is ready. Lucas didn't need much time because he had been throwing earlier, and Burden is going to make the change. And although Backman is a switch hitter, he's going to the left-hander, Lucas. Not only is Backman better from the left side, but he's only batted once from the right side. Reardon's talking to Lanny Harris right now. Then where's that 3-2 pitch to Gibbon? Ball was inside. That third time to turn around may be his charm. But Jeff properly going to go to the dugout, but he may not be through. We'll see. No, he can certainly talk from there. But it looks like he's got his gear and he's going to the clubhouse. So Gary Lucas comes in. Lucas with no record and an ERA of 6.35, making his sixth appearance already this season. He's finished two previous games and has two saves. He's pitched five and two-thirds innings, giving up nine hits, four earned runs. He's walked one and struck out seven in five and two-thirds innings of work. In 62 relief appearances for San Diego last year, he was five and eight with 17 saves, an excellent 2.87 ERA. Jeff Reardon pitches a two and two-thirds innings, gives up one hit, strikes out two, and walks two. And leaves the bases loaded. He cannot get the save in this ball game. Should the Expos hang on to win, I guess he could be awarded the save by the official score and the provisions made. But he's not going to finish the ball game. No, that's one of the provisions. Yeah, he can't finish the no ball way. game, so no. he can't get the save. No way. And should the Mets score and win the game here in the bottom of the ninth, Reardon would be the losing pitcher.
Lee would be the winner if the Expos hold on. Gary Lucas is the top left-handed reliever over the last three years in the National League with 46 saves. As you see, the bases are loaded, and the guy you just saw before is the important run for the Mets. John Gibbons at second representing the winning run. Interesting situation. The wind blowing out. Backman does not have good power. Thomas is too deep in left field. You got to cut off the base hit now and be more inclined to have a ball hit over your head. Backman's going to hit a ton more in front of you than he is over your head. The other two outfield positions are shortened up. And swing and a miss. Backman did not have a real good swing at it either. Look at the standard sinker slider pitcher. Very interesting switchboard guy. 6'5. 200 pounds. He's a tall guy. <laughs> oh, Wally's going to run in the dirt and it's 0 and 2. Had two bad hacks at slider. So I would imagine Carter and Lucas will come back with a slider. Bases loaded, two out, bottom of the ninth inning, and the Mets trailing by one. again and it's foul back right here so Backman holds on the count still 0 and 2 strawberry representing the tying run at third Gibbons the winning run at first Hodges is on at first and his walk pushed them into scoring position Catch it on the bounce before <laughs> home plate umpire Lenny Harris can see it. Watch this play by Carter. It's a good play. Never works, but it's a good play. It looks good. Gives you an idea. Carter is some competitor. I'll tell you that. He is some player, and has been for a long, long time. And it's amazing how he can continue to be as durable as he is and as effective catching as many games as he does. It really is. Still a two strike count with two out. Running four straight sliders. Line drive. It's going to be in there for extra bases. One run is in the game inside. Here comes Gibbons. The Mets win. Five. A two strike, two out. Extra base hit into the left field corner. And the Mets have come back to win their first home game of the year after getting drubbed 10 to nothing yesterday as they battle back with two out in the bottom of the ninth against two of the toughest relief pitchers in baseball, and they win it 5-4. Make that five straight sliders. Gary Lucas going to the well once too often. And a very angry Gary Lucas. The loser Jeff Reardon with two out. Reardon walks. John Gibbons on a magnificent at bat. He walked pinch hitter Ron Hodges on a 3-2 pitch. And after four straight sliders, Wally was looking inside again and whacked himself a double. I love it. And you know, Tim, the things we've talked about, about building confidence in the young players, hanging with them and doing the things necessary to let them have the opportunity to win ball games have paid off here in this ball game for New York. Wally receiving the applause and a chant of Wally Wally comes out and acknowledges the fans here at Shea and those who have remained are thrilled here at Shea Stadium this afternoon. Perfect for Easter week to say so be it. That's right. Tim and I will be back with a wrap up. Kiner's Corner will follow so stay with us here on Channel 9 as the Mets come from behind to win it 5-4. to four.